This one in particular was squished in between 17 and 19 and to the fact that there was only one outstanding match. Yeah, it makes sense that the event as a whole isn't spoken about. The weird thing about this is the fact that the WWF turned into the WWE only a month and a half later. There was the brand split that was coming up and the roster was stacked. In terms of star power, no other year comes close. Nada. And the whole vibe in the WWF at the time feels totally different to what went down four months later. And it's like a different year in a way. HVK was there, the NWO was gone, Austin's gone, Eddie Guerrero's back. So much change went down in the year of 2002. With that said, let's get into it. WrestleMania 18 was held in the Sky Dome in Toronto, Ontario, Canada on March 17, 2002. 68,237 were in attendance to witness history going down. The buy rate itself took a bit of a hit, you know, WrestleMania X7 drew over a million in the buy rates, whereas this event drew 860,000. The theme songs for the event were Tear Away by Drowning Pool and Superstar by Saliva. Well, that's so 2002. Also, a video game for the Nintendo GameCube was named after this WrestleMania, and damn was it forgettable. Compared to the other GameCube titles, it was pretty weak. And again, it was the first kind of WWF game on the console, so let's say. Enough talk, let's get into it. Right when the show began, Saliva performed the song Superstar, which you might be familiar with if you watched the first Fast and Furious movie, you know, more than you can afford pal scene. And it's definitely a memorable WrestleMania performance. It's probably the first one that pops in my head when I think, oh, WrestleMania performances. The first match was for the Intercontinental Championship. Rob Van Dam challenges William Regal for the gold. Regal at this point was the biggest cheater in the entire WWF. He was synonymous with the brass knuckles, whereas RVD was one of the most over wrestlers on the entire roster. He floored with the main event for a bit, and I should know this was his first WrestleMania. He had attended WrestleMania 3, but as a fan. Van Dam quickly brought the fight in the early going, inflicting damage on the champ. He was frantically searching for his weapon, but then RVD kicked that out of his hands and almost hit the frog splash, but Regal moved out of the way and began taking control. He didn't accomplish much during this juncture of the match, as Van Dam was still fast and furious. Regal catches him with a little takedown, hits the soup, and the pace was finally slowed down. The challenger didn't even stay down for long, hitting a back body drop and some rights. Regal once again didn't remain on the defense for long as he caught RVD with a neck breaker. Because of the unorthodox offense, Regal's mouth was busted. Van Damme had his moments to shine, but was the outright aggressor. He attempts to pick up the pace, hits a few moves, but the champion stops him dead in his tracks, and damn what an overhead suplex that was. <laughs> The way RVD sells always impresses me. I just love watching his matches due to the fact that he sells these moves as if they're death or something. At this point, Regal decides to bring back the Nux, but the ref took notice. Oh wait, there's another one in his hand. Regal's too occupied and boom, he gets a kick in the face. Van Dam goes to the high rent district and hits the five star frog splash. One, two, three, good match. Why? It was quick, didn't waste time and served its purpose. Do I wish it was longer? Oh yes, most certainly. RVD was fun to watch and it's cool seeing him capture the belt for the first time here. I feel RVD and Jeff are synonymous with this version of the title. Maybe Christian too, so there's that. Yeah, good opener. It did its job and that was to get the fans hyped up for the show. In the back, Lillian Garcia interviewed Christian regarding the events of Monday. For some reason, he turned that DDP. You know, he was all in on his little program. Christian made it seem like he was progressing well or whatever. Then he just turned on him on the final Raw. He said that he doesn't need him anymore and took a jab at Toronto calling it a second race city. He was ready to reclaim the championship of Europe and what is that face? Next match is for the European Championship Christian who relocated to Tampa getting boost from the crowd faces Diamond Dallas Page for the gold. That was a smart tactic. They were cheering him but after that not a chance. DDP his push was botched but we already know that. This was his first official WrestleMania appearance I should note. He appeared at WrestleMania 6 as the chauffeur for Rhythm and Blues because it was his pink Cadillac. Right out of the gate, Christian goes on the attack. Paige bounces back with a gut buster of sorts before brawling on the outside. Sorry if this one was simple. Christian used DDP for a while and got a title shot. In the ring, Christian takes back control, throws the champ onto the ropes, cornering him. Didn't last long though because DDP's back in. He screws up by wasting time showboating, this leads to the abdominal stretch. The challenger's looking to wear him out, he goes up top and ends up landing on his own back, and once both men get up, DDP hits the sit down power bomb which gets him a near fall. A nice little countering sequence, unprettier, cutter, none of them were to be, and instead it was the inverted DDT. DDP kicked out which greatly angered Christian, but it didn't matter because a few seconds later, Diamond Dallas Page hit the diamond cutter, one, two, three. There it was. After the match, DDP grabbed the mic and praised Christian for not losing his temper after losing in front of 67,000 people, millions at home, and all of a sudden, Caillou entered Christian's soul and he's throwing a temper tantrum again. Hey, just there. I didn't expect much and compared to the first match, it was certainly weaker. 
That's what I thought. It's not bad, it just wasn't that much of a big deal. In the back, Jonathan Coachman interviewed the Grey One ahead of his match with Hollywood Hogan, and regarding Hulkamania running wild on him, The Rock wanted it. He wanted Hogan in all his glory tonight. He asked Coach if he said his prayers, to which he responded, I've been busy. So The Rock asks the crowd if they'd like to see the coach say his prayers, and Coach is like, what up, G? Just wanted to give you a quick shout out, and The Rock was anything but impressed. He's like, what up, G? You get out of here, you sick freak! And then he spoke about Hogan again. He asked the Immortal One, like, what you gonna do when the Rock runs wild on you? He knew damn well that the fans will be chanting their name. And then he said that Hogan will smell what the Rock is cooking. Cool interview. Not my favorite Rock WrestleMania interview. That's Act 3. That promo in itself is one of my favorites of all time. The next match is for the Hardcore Championship. Goldust challenges Maven. So the belt was under the 24-7 rule at this point. This night in particular is actually one of the more memorable ones in the history of the title. Maven was on Tough Enough only five months earlier, yet was on the WrestleMania card, defending the title in a singles match nonetheless. It took Kofi Kingston and Dolph Ziggler 12 years to even have a singles match at WrestleMania. Just comparing them. Right out of the game, Goldust attacked Maven, he elbowed the champ on top of the barricade and brought out the weapons, he brought out a cookie sheet, trash can, and Goldust ended up discovering a golden shovel which was probably Triple H's. He used it in a unique way before launching the champ into a trash can corner, they knocked down each other with weapons and all of a sudden, Spike Dudley runs in there and steals the Hardcore Championship. Crash Holly follows suit, Goldust gets angry and they all make their way to the back. Can't really rate this one, it literally lasted 3 minutes. It was more an angle in my eyes, at least. Also, it wasn't the last we've seen of the Hardcore title. Next up, Drowning Pool performed Tearaway, which seems to really suit Stephanie McMahon's character at the time. You know, I don't care about anyone else but me, or whatever. Oh, who am I kidding? I know the entire song. I believe the lead singer of the band, you know, he kind of resembles Bray Wyatt. He died four months after this, and they had to replace him. I'm not sure, but some believe the band never recovered from Dave Williams' passing. This wasn't the last song WWF had from Drowning Pool. In the back, Crash and Spike go at it. Al Snow with a damn car crashes into a bunch of boxes. Spike knocks down Crash and Hurricane from out of nowhere comes in and steals the belt. The next match was between Kurt Angle and Kane. To me, this match is, oh, hey, we value you, but we don't have anything for you. Before the match, Angle said that if he won his Olympic gold medal like Canada's figure skating team did in February, if he won it by whining and crying, he'd shoot himself. Kane then let him finish speaking, and Angle realizes he's gotta find a way to steal the advantage, so he strikes Kane with a ring belt. Kane was already hurting the head as the commentary stated, and the Olympic gold medalist at this point was 100% on offense. He takes his eyes off the big red machine, and so he fights back. Kane at this point, he wasn't really messing around. Angle, on the other hand, was quick and elusive, catching Kane with a belly to belly. He was delivering shots to the head, which, like I said, was a red target. Rights and kicks, back body drops to the head. He was attempting to wear down his opponent, but it wasn't working. Kane goes for the suplex, but Angle, the wrestling technician, escapes and hits a hat trick of Germans. Despite this, Kane kicked out. So Angle goes up top and successfully hits the clothesline. He was so proud of it that he decides to go for it again, but like many movie sequels, fails to deliver. Both men exchange rights, Kurt loses of course, and has to rely on unethical shots. Big boot, come back from Kane, and he's starting to gain momentum. This leads to the choke slam, and it would have been it, but Angle put his arm on the ropes. Kane attempts the tombstone, but Angle tries pulling his mask, and this leads to the Angle slam. One, Two, no, I honestly thought that was it there. The straps are down and it's time for the ankle lock. Kane shouting in agony. Angle's trying to apply even more pressure, but Kane managed to reach the ropes. He refuses to let go and ends up screwing himself when the bigger red monster hits the Inseguri. Then he goes up top, but Angle catches him with a super belly to belly. Crowd popped for that one. Angle goes for the slam, but Kane counters looking for the choke slam. A little rollover leads to a pinfall attempt with Angle's foot on the rope and he steals it again. I thought I wasn't feeling this match initially, but they won me over, they really did. The crowd was into it, the near falls were convincing. Like, I really thought at one point Angle had the match won, but it wasn't the case. In the back, the Hurricane is hiding from potential enemies and ends up in the Godfather's his hose's locker room, and he decides, oh, I'm gonna pull out something. And Jerry Lawler's like, I told you he got superpowers, and the perv gets caught. Godfather goes after him, and the broomstick well, definitely sticks out in my mind as a memorable moment from the show, no pun intended. The next match was no disqualification. Ric Flair meets The Undertaker. I really love this story. Ric Flair was essentially dragged into this match, and Taker was just being a douche for no real reason. He wanted to get personal. I talked about some of it in this video. If you're interested, you could check it out. But anyways, Ric Flair was in a slump of sorts mentally at this point. I'll get into that later. The Undertaker was 9-0, and it was Flair's first WrestleMania since his title match with Randy Savage in 1992 at WrestleMania 8. The bell rings and right out of the gate, the dirtiest player in the game delivers rights. At one point it was like he forgot what he was doing and Taker had yet to muster up any sort of offense. Flair goes for an aerial move and this is where he messes up. Big Evil's beating him from pillar to post and the commentary team was reminding everyone of the Nature Boy's bad back. They were striking each other in the corner with vengeful intentions. Taker was busted and basically the blood got him all riled up. It was strike galore basically and yes, 
Flare was busted open as a result of this. It was about as likely as you blinking in the next 10 seconds, so there's that. Despite all the damage he took, the Nature Boy still had some fight in him. There was still something there, but the Undertaker was really trying to beat out all that resiliency. Like JR said, Flair was bleeding like a stuck pig, and that superplex really looked rough. Something about it was very different compared to the others. It likely would have gotten the Undertaker the victory, but he decided to continue the fight. Taker was fixated on two body parts, he had a little back and the forehead, and anything else was a bonus. He once again had an opportunity to win it, but nope, he prefers to continue. It was a massacre! He was showing signs of fighting back, such as moving out of the way, delivering chops, but it was still Taker's match to lose. As he goes for the old school, Flair drags him off the top rope, because he wasted too much time and ends up paying. Again, Flair's trying to build momentum, but all it takes is one move to stop him dead in his track. Flair evaded another attack and whacked Big Evil with a lead pipe, and yes, he was busted open. It clearly wore him down, but Taker quickly got back on track. Nature Boy brings in a sign, and in the ring, he's hitting a flurry of punches. Taker grabs him by the throat, but the 16-time champ low blows him and locks in the figure four. The fans are cheering, and it seemed like things were bad. Little Nature then makes the count, and all of a sudden... Taker sets up as if a demon enters his soul. Memorable image there. He has the choke slam. Lil Nate ends up getting involved, telling him to stop, but he's thrown into the turnbuckle, and all of a sudden flares back up. He bounces Taker off the ropes, and from out of nowhere, Double A Arn Anderson delivered a spine buster on the Undertaker. Flair goes for the cover. One, two, no. He ends up getting busted open, but Flair makes a save with a chair, repeated chair shots, but it's all for nothing as Big Evil knocks him down. Taker goes for the last right, but decides to go for the tombstone instead. One, two, three. That's all she wrote. Right after the match, he clotheslined the living hell out of Charles Robinson, and so he's 10-0 at WrestleMania. Another memorable image right there. Wow, that was really good. It felt old school and rough. They didn't execute many moves and instead opted to tell a story. It was really enjoyable and fun to see. During his short-lived podcast, Ric Flair spoke about the match. Eh, I quote, I would have loved to have worked with him when I was uh, like 35 or something like that. I could have really given him a match, but this worked out pretty good, Flair added. He sold the crap out of stuff for me. That's what got the match over because nobody thought I would be able to do anything with him. When he let me get him down on the ground, he let me get on him good. Mark carried me, but we did have a hell of a match. I eventually got comfortable, and that turned out to be a hell of a match, and I think everybody liked it. I mean, once again, I'm 59 in 2008, so in 2002, I'm what, 54? I don't know, but we really did have a hell of a match. It was just great. Once again, Mark carried me. Like I said, I really liked the match, and if Rock Hogan didn't deliver the way it did, no doubt in my mind it's a match of the night. Funny enough, The Undertaker was actually asked if he would like to wrestle Flair or RVD. Had he chosen RVD, I personally believe the entire landscape of the WWE would be very different. That's my personal opinion. In the back, Booker T was interviewed over the shampoo thing and how Edge believed he lacked intelligence. Booker offered his rebuttal stating that he ranked number one in SATs. He won an award on his high school thesis on the theory of relativity. Cole corrected him on something that Booker mispronounced and he got all angry. He promised that Edge will be the new spokesperson of the new book called I Just Got My Ass Kicked at WrestleMania. The next match was between Booker T and Edge. Two massive talents, especially Booker being placed in a feud over Shampoo. Are you serious? Booker T was finding his footing in the WWF and it took a while. Edge, on the contrary, was the hometown hero. The WWF was starting to push him hard, and I really liked this iteration of his due to how energetic and fast he was. He had some awesome matches during this time period. Of course, we gotta mention the fact that Edge attended WrestleMania 6 in the same stadium. Dwarf collar and elbow tie to start things off. Slight drop kick leads to the face buster. Near fall there. Flapjack from Booker leads to him taking control. Missile drop kick, and I just love the camera flashes. It makes it seem much more bigger than it is. It makes it seem like a huge spectacle. Edge was trying to fight, but ended up getting a spine buster, which wasn't enough for the victory. Booker goes up again, but Edge pushes the ropes and hits a hurricanrana. Once both men recover, Edge begins his comeback. Spinning heel kick, the clothesline. Booker almost puts a stop to it by hitting the scissors kick, but fails and takes an edge omatic. He goes up top and hits the spin kick, but again, Booker kicks out. Nice roll from Booker leads to a catapult. Edge goes for the spear, but it's not to be, and it was time for the biggest spin of Rooney ever. Booker hits the scissors kick, but again... Edge kicks out. As the five-time champ goes for the bookend, Edge reverses and hits a spear. One, two, no, it ain't it. So he randomly decides to go for the spinner, Rooney, and <laughs> it was off. A nice little sequence from both men leads to the execution. One, two, three, not bad. It was clear that they were lacking in time, so they tried to make the most out of it, and in my eyes, they succeeded. The match initially was going to be hair versus hair, but it was scrapped, and they decided to have a random ass feud involving shampoo. What's next, a cup of coffee? Oh, that's already been done, I'm sorry. In the back, the coach questioned the Hurricanes character after the stick incident, and Helms was angry over the thought of someone questioning him and thinking of him as the Hurra Perv. 
then sidekick fools him, wax him with a frying pan in order to steal the hardcore championship from him. Random stuff, but the Hura Perv was down. Okay, it's time to get into some serious business. The next match was between Stone Cold Steve Austin and Scowl. This one is weird to me. Stone Cold was the hottest thing in early 2002, but they decided to saddle him with Scott Hall, who wasn't into the whole thing. He had other issues in his life to deal with, and because of this, JR claims Chris Benoit was fuming. He didn't think Scott Hall belonged on the card because WrestleMania is usually reserved for the best. Also, I gotta mention the fact that the original plans were Austin Benoit, but Chris wasn't ready yet, and plus, I think regardless, it would have had Steve face Scott Hall in the end regardless of the fact that Benoit was there or not. Initially, Scott Hall was doing well, you know, he was recovering from substance issues, but being brought back to the WWF only seemed to have returned those problems. Anyways, Austin was pissed off over Nash being at ringside, but quickly brought the fight. Hall really struggled in the early going, and it was so bad that he couldn't take his vest off. The crowd was loudly chanting what along with every turnbuckle bump. Hall goes to the outside, and Nash takes a beating. In the ring, Scott finally bounces back with a kick and a clothesline, and he proceeds to corner the Texas Rattlesnake, all while Nash is on the other side, exposing the turnbuckle. This idea worked out pretty well for the UNWO, as Austin takes the bump and goes to the outside, where Nash applies additional damage. And so Scott Hall finally has control. He's wearing down the Texas Rattlesnake with follow-away slams, shots to the neck, he delivered this clubbing clothesline that I thought was cool, but again, Austin kicked out. Nash was still getting his shots in, they were all over him, and even when the ref comes into Warren Hall, Nash runs in and strikes. Austin managed to buy some time with a spine buster, and once both men recover, Hall delivers some of those strikes, and damn, he knew how to maximize the sound of those. I love him. All of a sudden, Steve hits the stunner, and as he goes for the cover, Kevin Nash drags the ref out of the ring. They saw Austin, but when they brought him in the chair, he escaped, and he stunned them. Again, he goes for the cover, but there's no ref. A couple of seconds later, ref runs in there, and damn, look how smooth the little slide was. Nash delivers an elbow like that, and the ref is knocked down. Once they recover, Hall tries to go for the outsider's edge, but Austin tosses him over the top rope. The refs ended up ejecting Nash out of the match, and in the ring, Hall hits the stunner. One, two, no, not enough. So he goes, he enjoyed that more than I expected. Maybe it's because I'm invested in both characters. Maybe that's why. The crowd ended up being into it by the end, and you can't tell me this match didn't have some awesome moments. The ref slide in the Nash elbow was just hilarious because it was all for nothing. Like, that could be a little meme over there, honestly. And that stunner is what legends are made of. I think it's one of the greatest stunner cells of all time. On Grilling JR back in July, Jim Ross spoke about Stone Cold's mindset towards WrestleMania 18. And I quote, I heard about the writing team saying, We're gonna do the heat thing with Austin. We're gonna beat him with Scott. I said, you're what? Are you? What's the logic behind that? And I said, have you communicated that to the talent? Oh, no, no, no. We haven't said a word just between us and Vince. So I go to Vince. Are we going to beat Austin at WrestleMania? Well, I'm thinking about it. I said, I think it's a bad decision because that's the way Vince and I communicated one-on-one. -on -one. He didn't want both. I didn't challenge him to the point of being obnoxious. I just said, I think that's the wrong decision to make. I think it's the wrong decision to make and I think it's gonna piss off Steve because he knows he can't have the match he wants to have at WrestleMania. We had guys on our roster that deserve that opportunity with Steve at WrestleMania. To work with Austin at WrestleMania is gonna help you get over whether you win or lose. So you're telling me, Steve was going to lose this one. Oh man, that would have been bad. Just because of the fact that Scott Hall ended up doing nothing, and it would have prevented us from seeing the stunner itself. But also because of the fact that Austin was misused. Like, he deserved somebody much better than a lost Scott Hall. Preferably Ric Flair. I mean, it was clear that Hogan wasn't going to happen because politics is going to politics. But my idea, and this is just me, I'd swap Taker and Austin, have him team up with Kane to face the Outsiders, and insert Angle in the main event. Could have been better, maybe, but then again, it could have been worse. I understand Stone Cold Steve Austin's frustration towards the WWF at this point. He ended up walking out the next night, too, I should know. But yeah, it's reasonable. They should have gave him somebody else. Somebody that wasn't Scott Hall. Scott Hall was in a bad mindset at this point also. He had other issues to deal with in his life, so let's this match. I didn't think it was bad, but someone like Austin needed like a four-star caliber match or something, right? They then showed footage of Access. Booker T complaining about not being featured and just bring it was a highlight. And why in the hell did I have a replica of Stacey Keeler's ass and legs? The ruthless aggression era, the attitude era, stuff was so damn different. The next match is a fatal four-way tag team match for the WWF Tag Team Championships. The Dudley Boys, the APA, and the Hardys challenged Billy and Chuck for the titles. Saliva performed the Dudleys' theme song. Stacey went up there for a few seconds, and the match itself was unofficially the swan song the Dudleys and the Acolytes as only one week later they'd be separated. 
The King was perving it up on commentary as expected and Billy and Chuck really felt out of their element. The other teams had been together for several years up to this point, whereas they were only a team for three months. The APA were impatient starting off the match, also I should note it was four corner rules. It took a while for Chuck to get into it, you know, Farouk and Bradshaw were quite aggressive compared to the others. The APA were dominant during this juncture of the match, the action spills all over the place and Bradshaw hit a mean looking clothesline from hell, but the Dudleys caught him with the 3D and so the APA were out of the match. The Hardys enter, double team Bubba and Devon, they get irritated so a table is brought in, but it wasn't used just yet though. In the ring, Jeff hits the whisper in the wind and just as he goes for the swanton, Stacy's on the apron. Jeff shakes his hips along with her and smacks her ass. Hell, he even kissed her at one point. This leads to a double team from Billy and Bubba. Bubba was really dominant. Jeff was really struggling. He was getting bounced around the ring with no end in sight. Hell, even Devon got him some of the daredevil. The whole Bubba on offense thing lasted for so damn long. Matt had to get involved to put some sort of stop to it. And Devon knew that Jeff was going to tag, so he prevented it from happening. It really wasn't working for the Hardys until Jeff countered into an inverted DDT. The crowd's rallying him on, and Matt is finally in. He builds momentum. That is until Bubba back dropped him. He misses up top and Matt hits the leg drop, but Bubba kicks out. They're preparing the Waza when Devon gets pushed off the top and through the table. Bubba on the ring takes a twist of fate and two remain. All King could worry about was if Stacy could stay around there. At this point in time, Team Extreme was damn near unstoppable. They hit the finishing combo, but Billy hit the famous sir. One, two, no, the match continues. So Billy decides to bless Jeff with a gold and that's enough. The match itself did kind of drag and it was my least favorite of the night, but it's not like it sucked. It just should have gone down a bit different, maybe a bit shorter. Also, it would have been cool to see the Hardys win the tag titles at WrestleMania. It would have been an awesome visual. But I guess the WWE planned to split them anyways, or just wanted to push Billy and Chuck. But yeah, it probably would have been much cooler to see the Hardys hoist the titles in the air. Probably would have been remembered much more fondly. In the back, Hall and Nash wanted to make sure that Jabroni gets it, but Hogan told him to stay put. Why? Because he wanted to prove to himself that he can do it. Meanwhile, Mighty Molly is running off trying to hide from potential challengers, when a half door knocks her out, and it's Christian. He goes for the cover to become the new hardcore champion. The next match was between Hollywood, Hulk Hogan, and The Rock. I can't really describe how hype I am, well, was past tense, to watch this again. Last time I watched it two years ago, it was fun, and no doubt I will enjoy it again. Spoiler alert, I did enjoy it. The build-up to the match compared to what went down is so damn different. I mean, Rock was placed in an ambulance for the NWO to crash into. Hogan wanted the fans to appreciate him again, but was angry over the fact that they turned on him. It was, of course, supposed to be Austin Hogan, but they couldn't come up with a finish, I guess. This was the next best thing, possibly for the better. The way The Rock improvised, I doubt it would have went the same way. Like, it could have gone down much terribly between Austin and Hogan. It's just a thought. Also, I strongly considered swapping both the main event and this, because I wanted to end the video on a very high, but it felt weird. I might do it in the future, though, if you guys want it. The crowd treated Hogan like a babyface. The young fans were all grown up and were so nostalgic. And right before the match even began, it was electric. It was unreal. No other WrestleMania crowd was as loud as Toronto, in my opinion, up to this point. Maybe ever. The bell rings and it's on. Collar and elbow tie up, Hogan easily pushes the great one away and that's enough to generate an entire crowd's response. Again, he delivers yet another side tackle and look at that damn crowd! Shots of the gut from Hogan and he delivers the rights. A little clothesline excites the fans, but Rock wasn't gonna sit down and take all that so he delivers a forearm. He trash talks the immortal one and delivers a slew of punches to send Hogan right out of there. Fans at this point start booing by the sounds of it, and the Rock was dominant during this juncture of the match. He almost hit the rock bottom, but was blocked, and now the fans were happy. Hogan with several elbows, a little rake, clothesline in the corner of the commentary team were really selling this moment. It didn't need selling, but they still did it anyways. When the rock fought back, you'd think he was the heel, and Hogan's a baby face. He locks in the abdominal stretch before going for the roll up, the back scratch in there. Hell, he was even biting the rock at one moment. But again, the gray one fights back, and the fans are jeering. He then ran into a choke slam. I gotta mention this again, the crowd was simply unreal as for the action. Rock was trying to build momentum, but was thrown over the top rope. Hogan began fighting dirty, all while Mike Yoda was warning him. He wasted too much time, and this almost led to Rock using the chair, but Mike Yoda took it away, and he received a clothesline. In the ring, Rock is trying to fight back, but he ended up getting shoved into the ref, but this wasn't enough to stop him, as the Great One hit the spine on a pine. Both men recover, and Hogan's locked in a sharpshooter. Ref still down, but this didn't mean Hogan was tapping. He refused to give up, and ended up reaching the ropes, but Rock dragged them back to the middle of the ring, and he's finally tapping. This clearly frustrated Rocky, adds to the fact the fans were booing him, yeah, it was bad. Hogan Law blows him and boom, he hits the rock bottom. One, two, no, that ain't it. The ref's too dizzy at this point, so Hogan brings in a belt and whoops Rock's ass. But despite all this, the great one matched to DDT Hollywood, take a page out of his book, and heal it up. 
So now Rock's the de facto villain. This leads to the Rock bottom one, two. He kicked out. Rock couldn't believe it because Hulk Hogan was hulking it up and Toronto was unglued. He pointed at him, you know, the U, the little boot, and the leg drop. One, two, Rock kicked out. Oh, man. Since that's not enough, Hogan delivered a couple of rights before going for the boot again. The leg drop wasn't to be until The Rock catched him with a rock bottom. He knew Hogan was going to kick out, so he decides to do it again, but it's still not enough in his eyes, so he kipped up and hit the most electrifying move in sports entertainment that day. The people's elbow. One, two, three. Absolutely incredible. It was a match for the ages. The guys before the bell even rang reeled you in for a roller coaster ride that nobody will forget. Truly a remarkable and legendary WrestleMania match. Rock knew his role this time around pun intended, and he knew that the fans were going crazy for Hollywood, so he improvised. It lived up to the hype and then some, and I personally think it's for the better we got this instead of Austin Hogan. Austin wasn't in form, and I don't think him taking the L would have been good to see. After the match, Hollywood offered his hand out, Rock was skeptical but ended up giving in. The NWO were pissed because of this and they ended up attacking, but Rock made the save and they fend off the outsiders. JR was as confused as anybody, another great moment there, and as Hogan's exiting the ring, Rock pulls him back in and shows that he's a huge mark for Hulkamania. Hulk finally embraces the love from the crowd, Rock was literally playing mascot at this point, just look at that guy. But yeah, there will never be a match like this. Cena vs Rock was definitely better if you look at it like from bell to bell, this one it just had something even more special to it. Like, Cena Rock is very special to me. It's one of my top 10 favorite WrestleMania matches. This one, there was just something else about it. It was like capturing lightning in a bottle. It was the most electrifying match in WrestleMania history, probably. It wasn't about how many moves they could hit. All they needed to do was pose and do their signature moves. That's all, and that was enough here. In a Q&A video last year, The Rock spoke about this iconic match in the moment he gave Hogan the green light to be the good guy. I quote, What that decision did, it gave 68,000 people the runway in the platform to not be conflicted in that moment. They went, oh, and you can hear 68,000 people go, ah, because what it did immediately identified. Great. Rock is a bad guy, Hulk Hogan is a good guy. It's okay that I cheer for Hulk Hogan because of how Rock just reacted. In another interview, immediately after the match on WWF.com, Rock described this match to be his greatest moment. This is by far the greatest night in the history of my career. Rock told WWF.com. In this industry, my main objective was to be the absolute best, period. And what Hogan did for me tonight, I can't thank him enough. Rock says that performing in front of almost 70,000 fans, most of whom were on their feet and screaming for the entire bout, was a moment he won't soon forget. It's the greatest feeling, period, he said. I dare say it will never be duplicated. You think about 70,000 people, non-stop screaming for almost 40 minutes, it's a testament to their passion. The People's Champion admits that he was surprised that the crowd was booing him for a bit, but as that he was confident that it wouldn't last for long. I love the fact that they're so passionate, he said. They show me their passion when they cheer me, and they show their passion when they boo me. What I love about it is that I had the confidence in my relationship with the fans that I could turn to them and say, continue to boo me because I'm going to continue to entertain you, and for that I'm so thankful for them. I'd like to end this interview just by saying I can't thank Hulk Hogan enough for what he did for me. Wow, it's just mesmerizing. People say, oh, if you put it on mute, the match sucks. Well, why in the hell would I do that? It's kind of unnecessary, and while I agree with you, the match itself ain't that good on mute. The crowd really added greatly, and watching on mute is a huge missed opportunity. Like, you'd be missing out on a hell of a lot of stuff if you mute it. I never watched a match on mute before in my life, and it doesn't make sense. I mean, there is one match you should watch on mute, and that is Rollins vs. Ziggler, but regarding this, you just have to appreciate it for what it is. Also, The Rock didn't forget about Toronto booing him. That's one thing to know. He didn't forget that the Mother Canuckers booed him. I just gotta mention that. But yeah, nothing can follow this. They showed the Big Show hanging out at Access, which is kinda sad. And in the arena, Howard Finkel announced a Sky Dome attendance record. WWE really loves those. The next match was a triple threat match for the WWF Women's Championship. Poor ladies. Jazz defends the gold against early 2000s fashion icon Lita and Toronto's own Trish Stratus. It's funny hearing JR screw up the name of Lita's song. But anyways, they go at it quickly while Trish is making her entrance. They double team Jazz, who actually no, wasn't backing down. She managed to dominate both women, double arm suplex, a spin kick to Trish. Crowd wasn't that loud and lead on the ring. It's a head scissors, blue thunder bomb, like power bomb. Trish runs back in, takes a crossbody, but manages to roll around. It was really anybody's match. At one point, Trish hit a beta chick kick before going for the bulldog. Jazz breaks the fall and boom, splash. Trish takes a fisherman, Lita had to kick Jazz in order to prevent the finish, Jazz goes for a slam and Trish counters into the reverse DDT, those two have a little moment, knock down Jazz, and it's on. Trish took a weird bump and Lita had to twist the fan, the champion, and the moonsault kinda worked, but Trish put her legs up, went for a roll up that for a quarter of a second got me believing it was it. 
They bump into each other and the crowd chants, We want puppies. Jez is thrown to the outside and Trish splits her legs. Good God almighty, that was insane. Leanna tries going for something when Trish returns a favor. Jez pushes her away and hits a fisherman's buster that looked and sounded rough as hell. One, two, three. That was ugly. Not in a bad way. It was clear the match was going to cool down the crowd, but it turned some entertainment. At least for me, it was decent. Trish was the hometown hero, but it took a while for her to get that shiny moment. Jazz looks strong as hell, and I really think she should be mentioned more when they talk about the women of the past. Yeah, if she lost here, she would have halted her momentum, I guess. In the back, Christian's flaunting that thing in his hand when Maven comes in and rolls him up, steals his title, and most importantly, his cab. Christian throws a fit once again, and it was time for the main event. Triple H challenges Stephanie McMahon's lackey, the undisputed World Wrestling Federation champion himself, Chris Jericho. So the build-up for this was something. It was mostly revolving Triple H and Stephanie's marriage. Hell, even a dog was much more important to the build of this damn match than Chris freaking Jericho. I had to come out here in this cold and take Triple H's dog for a walk. The game's dog. The guy who in my eyes is top 10. Top 10 all time. The dog was much more important than him in the build to this match. Like, come on. It's really annoying to see and many of us think for a fact that the title reign was botched. He was second fiddle to everyone and just look at him here. He just didn't belong in the main event of WrestleMania, honestly. Drowning Pool performed the game which was featured on the new WWF album at the time, and Chris Jericho had a cool ass jack, and of course, Stephanie was there with him. The build up needed more of Jericho and less of Stephanie, honestly. It needed to be much more interesting. Triple H was jacked as hell, and the story of the match was his leg. Collar and elbow tie up in the corner. Jericho was really trying to throw the game off his game, and the commentary team were making him seem like a big underdog. He started taking control, but his instincts got the best of him, and the Harley Race D did some damage to himself. Also, I gotta mention this right now, but Bret Hart was actually asked to officiate this match. Like, that would have drawn even more attention away from the competitors, right? Anyways, Jericho delivered several kicks to the injured thigh, a chop block, and the game was in pain. Triple H takes him down and delivers the rice before targeting Dwight to Jay's leg, and he suddenly begins going after him. You know, the tables were turned. Stephanie is starting to get concerned and the game goes for the figure four. Ex-wife gets involved and ends up taking a colossal tackle from her business partner. Triple H was trying to go for the pedigree, but Jericho hits the missile dropkick and again, the focus was back on the knee. Even Stephanie got a shot in. In the ring, Chris Jericho went back to work, bending that knee, applying excruciating pain to the game, and Stephanie again slaps him. Jericho goes for the figure four on the post and he still had fighting him, but all it took Jericho was one little touch to that loose knee. Neckbreaker puts the stop to the onslaught on the knee. Nice close on from the game leads to a near fall, but despite all all this the knee was still a huge red target he makes up for that weird spine buster i like the selling for it a rough irish whip from chris jericho sends triple h to the outside and the champ decides to clear the desk the walls wasn't to be but jericho quickly righted the ship by throwing the challenger over through the other table in the ring jericho at the lion saw the game kicked out crowd didn't really react to it though jericho makes a little mistake and it was time for the pedigree nope why to Jay locks in the walls? Stephanie was rubbing it in. Triple H was screaming in agony, but he had enough wherewithal to reach the ropes. Then Stephanie distracts the ref, so Chris brings in a chair, and it would end up being his wrongdoing as the game DDT'd him right on it. Hebner, meanwhile, shoved the billion dollar princess. She enters the ring and ends up taking a pedigree. Crowd cheered, of course. Jericho blessed him with a chair that sounded like a gunshot. One, two, he kicked out. So Y2J attempts to go for the pedigree. That doesn't work, and he gets catapulted to the top rope. He runs straight into a kick to the gut. Fans stand up and boom, pedigree. One, two, three. Oh, well, that was the loudest the crowd's been during the match. It wasn't bad. Dare I say it was good. Could it have been better? Yes. The buildup really screwed it over. It was a decent story with the game's luck being worked on, but it was a foregone conclusion. And that's the fact that Hogan and Rock sucked out all the energy in the fans. Yeah, it was a bad idea to main event. I mean, if you look past this, it's really one of the more underrated WrestleMania main events. Like I said, it's hard to look past that. In an interview with Inside the Ropes, Chris Jericho elaborated on the main event. And I quote, let's be honest, it was a main event in the fact that it was on last, but the main event of the show was Hogan and Rock, and I knew it. Jericho admitted, and it was actually most of the people pitching to have their match on last. I was pitching for Triple H and I not to go on last because, like I said, how do you follow Hogan and Rock? And Triple H, and probably rightfully so, was fighting for the title match to be last, but we couldn't follow it. You could just see the air go out of the room. That's a match I had never watched it back. I remember being kind of disappointed in it. Main event WrestleMania? Just because you're on last doesn't make you the main event, but still, we were on last, and I could say that I still have the card they gave out with the programs. It was an old school card that had all the matches, WrestleMania main event, Jericho vs. Triple H. With my legacy established and some people saying that Jericho is the GOAT and all this other stuff at the time, I was the first Undisputed Champion, but that was the end of the line. It took me seven years to win the title back again, and that run with the Undisputed Championship 
To win it was great, but the whole run with it was terrible for me, in my opinion. It was more of a forgotten thing, so the build-up for the WrestleMania match wasn't great. The positioning of the match wasn't great, in my opinion, the match wasn't great, but I can say I was in the main event of WrestleMania, so there you go. You know, I'm personally glad y 2 got his main event, so there's that. You know, he's an all-time great, and it would have been a shame if he never got to main event it. But I do find it funny how he was paid a high five-figure sum, whereas Triple H made about eight times that much. He got angry and let management know about it. Vince ended up cutting him a check for a sum that was even more than what Chris expected himself. But overall, WrestleMania X8 was good for me. Before even making the video, I had doubts on whether or not I'd fit in my top 10 WrestleManias, you know? It's always been a favorite of mine ever since I was a kid. And watching it again affirmed that thought. My least favorite match is a tag. Some of it was good, but for the most part, it was there. It was just there. Loman were placed in an unfortunate place. Opener was never talked about. Undertaker and Flair was an old school battle that brought a smile to my face. Nature Boy showed that he still got it. Austin's positioning in the card was really baffling. You know, he was a top guy, yet they had him face an unmotivated Scott Hall. A Scott Hall that had his own personal demons to deal with. Hogan Rock is everything you can want from it. Truly a legendary affair. And there's not many matches that reach that level of acclaim. It was simply lightning in a bottle as for the main event good match wrong placing on the card it should have been the main event honestly it wasn't it didn't even have the most hype heading into it it was a good match it could have been better yes yes jericho and triple h had way better matches in the past so there's that in general wrestlemania 18 like i said uh it didn't reach the level of 17 it's like wrestlemania 17 2.0 for me though like the lighting the vibe it kind of reminds me of wrestlemania 17 it's like it's a little brother or something at least that's how I see things. I enjoyed the event, but other than Hogan and Rock, there's nothing special there. Like, the matches, they were good, but they weren't WrestleMania quality. They didn't have that WrestleMania feeling to them. I'm pretty sure a bunch of these matches happened on Raw after WrestleMania. Personal experience, I haven't watched this one in full in seven years. Many consider this to be the second greatest WrestleMania because of such historic, epic, impactful matches. But regarding WWE in 2003, which I need to remake a video on, it was hit and miss. Depends on who you are and depends on how you see it. I also enjoy more than dislike from that year, you know, Hollywood Rock, Y2J and Christian, a good-ass women's division, HBK was cool. And this is just from Raw alone. Like, if we talk about SmackDown, I'll take up the entire video, and that's exactly why I made something on it over here. With that said, the Attitude Era was no more, the Ruthless Aggression was in full force. Enough talk about 03, let's dive into the WrestleMania from Seattle, okay. WrestleMania 19 was held in the Safe Cove Field, currently at T-Mobile Park in Seattle, Washington on March 30th, 2003. 54,097 were in attendance to win a Stone Cold's final match in the buy rate. This is the odd one for me. It was 560,000, which was the worst since 1997. Oddly enough, No Way Out the previous month did 450,000 buys, and the Rumble actually beat WrestleMania by 25k. So I wanted to see what others say. Apparently the advertising of this event had more to do with Hogan McMahon, you know, 20 years in the making. Maybe some people thought, oh, it's gonna be the main event. Add to that, Austin and Rock were facing off for the third WrestleMania, with no real story attached to it. I guess people weren't interested. I do believe that if WWE promoted it as Austin's final match, it would have brought more buys, but what do I know? I also assume they didn't promote Angle and Lesnar because there was a worry Kurt wouldn't make it to the big event. Also, Lesnar wasn't a proven draw at this point. But yeah, in general, it's just very odd how the biggest show of the year didn't draw money. Moving on, a documentary was shot during the days leading to the big show called The Mania of WrestleMania. Jesse the Body of Ventura narrated it, and you can't deny it's one of the most underrated WWE documentaries. I haven't watched it in several years, but last time I watched it was very, very, very enjoyable. There was a game dedicated to the events on Nintendo GameCube, you know, WrestleMania 19. And compared to WrestleMania X8, it was much better, and I've yet to see a story mode like Revenge Mode in a WWE game. Like, during the 2000s, there was always some odd games being released, like Jackass, The Sopranos. Like, what I'm trying to say is that they always experimented with things. There's even a non-wrestling WWE game. Good game, but not on the level of Here Comes the Pain. But with that said, WrestleMania 19, Safe Cofield, let's get into it. Before the official show, RVD and Kane defended the tag team titles against Lance Storm and Chief Morley. RVD and Kane lost after the Dudleys interfered. And yeah, this match, it probably belonged on the card, but hey, it happens every year. There's always a WrestleMania match that gets bumped off. The whole thing was part of the ongoing Eric Bischoff slash Dudley Boys feud, and so Bubba wanted to save their jobs. Following this, John Cena performed with a little WrestleMania rap. Initially, he was supposed to do something with Jay-Z or Fabulous. Jay-Z backed down Fabulous was arrested the week before for gun charges. He denies this, however. Well, with that, I said Cena insulted Jay-Z, ridiculing him for backing out. And as for Fabulous, Cena mentioned the arrest stating it wasn't for the guns, but because his raps suck. 
He was calling himself a main eventer, promising to take over SmackDown and most importantly main eventing WrestleMania. The best part of this rap was when he kicked Jay-Z and Fabulous before stating, quote unquote, Yo, it's John Cena, Thugonomics hot as hell, he's just a bad idea like the XFL. Ryder claimed Vince was somewhat offended by the statement, but with regards to Cena, I find it ironic how he's dissing Jay-Z when just a few months later, he's taking that dirt off his shoulder, you know? That song. The first match was for the Cruiserweight Championship. Matt Hardy defends the gold against Rey Mysterio. This was the first WrestleMania singles match for Matt and the first WrestleMania match for Rey. The Cruiserweight title is somewhat respected at this point. At least we even made it to the main event of SmackDown one night in June of 2003, but... But after that, it was kind of forgotten about. Immediately, Matt sends Shannon Moore to go after his opponent, but ends up screwing himself over. Because of this, Rey Mysterio took control, and as he's going for a sunset flip, Moore comes in and gives way to the champion. What a maneuver. Cho called on the ropes from both the Sensai and the Lackey, but this still didn't stop Ray. He jumps off the ropes, wanting to run into the side effect, but again, it's not enough for the W. Following this, Matt wears down Ray, but the plan goes south, and the fans are trying to rally him on. He ends up building momentum after Harding runs into the post, and it was all Ray from here. Unfortunately, Shannon Moore ruined everything, and Matt hits the twist of fate. One, two, he kicked out. Because of this, Matt tries going for a razor's edge, but since this was Super Ray, he counters into a Huracurana, and it would have given him the victory, but Shannon put Matt's foot on the rope. He gets involved but bumps into the wrong guy and boom, 619. West Coast Pop wasn't to be and Matt catches Ray with a sudden pinfall attempt and by using the ropes, he retains. That was a very quick match. It was pretty good for the time given. It was a cool match to open up the show and they of course had a much better, much dramatic match on SmackDown a few months later, which I suggest you watch. But yeah, this one, it was a cool opener. It was good for what it was. Miller Light Girls arrive to the arena. They mention a bunch of matches going down, you know, Austin Rock, Hogan McMahon, and that's all. Next up, The Undertaker faced a train in the big show in a handicap match. Now, you guys all know that Nathan Jones was initially going to compete in this match, but since he was greener than Tajiri's mist, they were worried he was going to suck out there, I guess. Before the match went down, WWE's favorite band, Limp Bizkit, performed rolling, and I just want to mention, you guys think it's a coincidence that Limp Bizkit, one way or another, was involved in two WrestleManias that happened to be called the greatest ever? I don't think that's a coincidence. It's a fact that if Fred Durst and the band appeared in Tampa this week, it would definitely be a top three mania. As for Nathan Jones, like I said, he wasn't going to compete until he was kayfabe attacked on heat by the FBI and his opponents. A-Train disrespected Taker's bike and in the ring Big Show tries to make an attack. Unsuccessful and already Big Evil hits the choke slam. It might have gotten him the victory had Big Show never broke the fall. The heels were fuming and very frustrated already because The Undertaker was quick and elusive. A-Train comes in to see his first hand how agile Taker is and receives the old school. Big Show gets involved and A-Train hits the derailer. Rest distracted and Show launches him into the post. So now things are slowing down. In the ring Taker struggles all while a-Train and Big Show tag in and out. Chokeslam wasn't to be, but the armbar certainly was. He sees A-Train coming in low blows him before catching him with the cross arm breaker. Big Show crashes the party and we're back to where we were. From here, the Giant began wearing down the Undertaker with the abdominal stretch. A-Train comes in and does the same. Big Evil suddenly has a burst of momentum and counters before catching him with a back suplex. Once both men recover, Big Show bumps into Taker and A-Train catches him with a clothesline. He was really putting in a shift to piss off Big Evil at this point. He's trash talking, delivering rights, and he begins battling back, and now a trains the one who's faced. Regardless of the fact that Big Show was in the ring, The Undertaker managed to shift momentum to his side, and it wasn't until A Train hit the bicycle kick that he was stopped. Big Show finally hits a choke slam, but wait a minute, it's Nathan Jones. He delivers that spin kick, and in the ring, The Undertaker kicks out. He runs into the ring, boots A Train, and The Undertaker hits the tombstone. One, two, three. I honestly expected worse. And while it wasn't bad, it was boring. Like, it really should have been a bit shorter in my eyes. I always find it odd that The Undertaker faced A-Train in the Big Show at WrestleMania. Like, they should have just had one singles match in my eyes, but whatever, right? It's the fact that it's forgettable, you know? Like, even though his match at WrestleMania 20 with Kane wasn't that good, it was memorable as hell at WrestleMania 20. That match, it's one of the most memorable streak matches due to the return of the dead man and all that. This one, what's there to talk about? I mean, he beat two guys. What are we gonna say? Limp Bizkit performed, that's all. Other than that, you're not really going to say much. You're not going to say, oh, this was a legendary match or whatever. Meanwhile, the Miller Lite girls met the two iconic divas of the early 2000s. They disappear in order to discuss some ideas for later on. The next match was for the Women's Championship. Trish Stratus in her most iconic attire and Jazz, who should be in next year's Hall of Fame, challenged Victoria for the gold. Of course, all the things she said was dubbed, and this was Victoria at her best, probably. I prefer 04 Victoria, but that's just me. 
Right out of the gate, Jez tries to cause a ruckus. She attempts to forcefully ground Trish with strikes, a reverse crossface with a bridge. Trish begins fighting back, and JR is like, now might not be the time to get the crowd's adulation. And Victoria drops her on the ground before the first two get into it again. The heels basically destroy Trish during this part of the match, and they actually ended up working as a unit for all of 20 seconds. Jazz strikes first, but walks straight into a power slam. Trish runs in with a roll-up and a bridge, but it's not enough for the victory. She suddenly has a burst of aggression. Knee strikes, but again, Jazz halts her momentum. The heels fight again before Trish all of a sudden emerges with the same aggression as previously. Spin kick from Jazz catches the wrong guy and it causes Stratus to take back control. Hell, she even hit the chick kick, but Victoria ruins everything. Irish whip leads into a knee. Champ goes up top and gets her a Karana, and she was damn near unstoppable until Jazz caught her with the Boston Crab. Fans try rallying Trish until Jazz attempts an STF, and all of a sudden, Stevie Richards notices that his girl was gonna lose the title, so he gets involved. Still doesn't stop Jazz, though, but that kick certainly did. Victoria goes for the moonsault, but nobody's home, and Jazz gets thrown to the outside. And it's Trish's moment to steal the match, but Stevie comes in and whacks himself with a chair. He takes up Stratus Faction, and this leads to Victoria attempting to catch her off guard. But she walks into the chick kick. One, two, three. Not bad. I like this match way more than the women's match at WrestleMania X8. It felt much more aggressive, faster, and was way more memorable in my eyes. The women's division was really hitting its stride at this point, and I'd say 2003 was WWE's best women's year from that decade. A bunch of talented women coming into their own, like Trish, Molly, Victoria, and this match in itself is one of Trish's most important. It's probably the most memorable moment from her career, you know, that moment when she hoisted the title on this night. Depends on how you see it, you know. I could see her final match being the most memorable in your eyes. This is the one for me. In the back, Jonathan Coachman interviewed the great one. Oh yeah, this is my favorite interview of The Rocks. Probably ever. Coach is like, there's 54,000 people out there, and Rocky cut him off. He said that he didn't give a damn about the people, because those are the same people that booed him. Those are the same people that called him a sellout, and he does agree. He's a sellout. He sold out every arena, including this one. And in essence, Rock could care less about the fans. The reason why he was here was because he wanted to fulfill his destiny, and that is to beat Stone Cold Steve Austin. He admitted that it's eaten and consumed him. You know, the last two occasions he lost, he took the elbow regardless. The thing that Hollywood taught him is that Act 1 and Act 2 don't matter. Act 3 does. He's like, when Stone Cold Steve Austin goes one-on-one -on -one with a jabroni beaten, pie in, not afraid to sweat, not afraid to bleed, gonna beat that bald-headed bastard Garen damn Tito. I love that quote. And then, coach, The Rock would have done it all. He's like, finally, and there's a long pause, before he says, finally, for the final time. Incredible promo. The Rock admitted his wrongdoings and admitted that Stone Cold was bugging him for years. He's shown that he can win titles. He's beaten the likes of Triple H, The Undertaker, but he's never beaten Austin in a one-on-one -on -one match, especially on a huge stage like WrestleMania. It was a very serious promo, which is something you rarely see from Rock, and I, I love it. It was very different from the other promos of his. He's not out there to insult people. He's out there to talk about how the Stone Cold thing has been bugging him for years and how he wants to end it and prove to everybody that he can beat him on this night. I suggest you watch it if you haven't. You might like it as much as I do. Definitely my favorite rock interview. The next match was a triple threat tag team match for the WWE Tag Team Championship. Los Guerreros, Chavo and Eddie, and Chris Benoit and Rhino challenged the world's greatest tag team, Shouts and Benjamin, and Charlie Haas. None of these guys were at WrestleMania 18. And all of them were solid, great in-ring performance, so this one's gonna be good. Right out of the gate, all six men brawl with one another, and once Jimmy Cordero gets control of the situation, Chavo and Charlie start things off. Guerrero managed to hit a back drop, a drop kick, and Benoit's in. He quickly runs in with an arm drag before his good buddy Eddie's in, and they go at it in the corner. Then while with vicious chops, a very rough bump from both men and Rhino's in. They go at it for a few. Rhino catches him with a power slam, but Shelton Benjamin preferred to tag himself in. Stiff elbow kick out, and the champs begin working on Rhino. Cole and Taz are discussing science class and dissection or whatever. All of Benoit is delivering a snap suplex. Then it's a bag drop that wasn't enough for the W, and he was very quick in getting his things in and tagging Rhino back in. Haas managed to run away to Shelton, who gets his ass kicked for a bit before Eddie tags himself in. He fooled Rhino out of nowhere with a drop kick, making him think it's a test of strength. But luckily for himself, Benoit tags in. He catches Eddie with a superplex and goes to the cover, but Shelton breaks the fall. And Benoit, who got this straight out of 2K14 or something, tries going for a mid-air crossface. Champs didn't want to see him because of this, Eddie got the chance to hit the suplex. Or he thought he was going to hit the hat trick there. Chavo comes in with loads of momentum, head scissors, crowds cheering, but Benoit counters his move with that German suplex. Well, four of them, and during this whole thing, Chavo tagged out, leading to a super kick. One, two, Eddie breaks it. Leg drop from Shelton, and as he goes for the cover, Eddie hits frog splash. Haas runs in, goes for a belly to belly, and gore! Fans go crazy, and he hits another one. Eddie brings him to the outside, and Shelton takes advantage. One, two, three, team angle, red taints. That was a good ass match. Definitely the best one so far. Those impactful moves, crowd was exciting, can't say anything bad. I do feel that Edge was probably going to be the one who was going to feature in the match instead of Rhino, but whatever. 
Team Angle looked really good out there, and I just wish they did more with them afterwards, you know? Like in 2006 and 7, I really think they had potential to put on some good-ass matches then and there. In the back, Tori and Stacy argue over who made WrestleMania, Hogan or Vince. The Miller Lite girls then argue. All of a sudden, they argue over the cat for being in the ring or in bed. Fans are cheering, and this guy was damn near about to have a stroke. Wait till they tell him it's gonna last about two minutes. The next match was between Shawn Michaels and Chris Jericho. For my money, two of the greatest all-around performers of all time. They are definitely up there with Randy Savage as the best all-around performers, you know. It's not the greatest of all time, it's the guys that can play two roles exceptionally, wrestle with many guys of different styles. I, I, you get it, basically. All around. The story of this one as explained by Chris Jericho came abruptly. He was initially going to face Edge, but after Michaels told Vince that a program with Jericho is <laughs> cash, they went that direction. It was a dream match that was finally coming true, and Shawn Michaels initially was going to have one last match, but then that turned into a part-time run and eventually a full-time run following WrestleMania. Well, the eyes down their iconic attires, there was an iconic shot, and already Shawn Michaels was exhausted from making his entrance. Collar and elbow types to start things off, take down into a head scissors from Jericho, and already Jerry Lawler was impressed that they're starting off with some wrestling. Shades of the dragon with some arm drag takedowns and Michaels has yet to break a sweat. He wasn't really that worried. Hammerlock, elbow, hip toss, single leg takedown, and a stalemate. Side headlock for Michaels and SJR explained he didn't want things to escalate yet. Jericho with a takedown but runs into a nope. He slaps the hard break kid and ends up getting thrown over the top rope. He shows his intelligence for all of two seconds and in the ring, HPK goes for the crossbody but Y2J uses that momentum against him. Once he gets back up, he bounces off the ropes with a spinning heel kick before throwing some haymakers. Hard Irish whip, some choke in the corner and he bounces Michaels off the turnbuckle and ends up hurting himself. So HPK goes for the figure four because of this he opted to work on the left leg, but not much came out of it however as Jericho pushed him into the post. Michael skins the can, head scissors his opponent right out of the ring before diving over the top rope. They brawl on the outside for two seconds before Michaels found himself in the walls. Charles Robinson reached the count of eight when Chris ordered him to stop. He didn't want that count on victory though, you know, he wanted to show that he is better than Shawn Michaels. And also, we gotta mention the fact that he didn't want to be Shawn Michaels. He wanted to be his own man. He launches his childhood idol into the post twice before finding time to fill up his finisher meter. Springboard, awesome one at that. And in the ring, the guy who beat Austin and Rock continues working on that back, all while he's shouting that he's better than Shawn Michaels. He hit that rough-looking backbreaker that generated some booze and even went for that nonchalant pin attempt. Chin lock with the knee applying pressure to the back, but Michaels tries fighting. Right to the eye stops him for all of two seconds as he managed to hit that DDT. Both men are down in the mat. Charles Robinson's making that count, and once they recover, Michaels delivers a few rights before running into his own forearm, and to top it all off, gimmick infringement, Michaels kips up and gains a hell of a lot of momentum. He showed exactly why he's missed WrestleMania, and almost stole the match then and there. He was catching Chris with roll-ups, counters, until this moment, where Chris was gonna go for the walls, but gets flipped over. They forcefully counter moves until Chris hits the Northern Light suplex, but it's not enough for the W. Despite the way, Michaels managed to forcefully lift Jericho up and attempt to backslide himself, but Chris escaped. Bulldog, then the lion saw, but he took a while to go for the cover and it wasn't enough. Following this, he managed to catch Michaels with the walls. Fans get up from their seats, but despite the pain he was in, HBK reaches the ropes and almost steals it with the inside cradle. Underhook into a backbreaker from Jericho and he goes up top. Reverse elbow and nice camera flashes. Like, I just love those camera flashes. I could go on and on all day about why they're awesome. All of a sudden, Y2J imitates Michaels with the sweet chin music. JR loses hope, but he kicked out. The man was still in the match. Once HBK recovers, he quickly bounces back with numerous strikes. He opts to go for the walls. No, it was actually the catapult, and he capitalized with the roll-up. But again, Chris kicks out. He was struggling with a match to right the ship with a strike to the back. He goes for a back drop, but Michaels countered in midair. One, two, no. As Michaels goes up top, Jericho intelligently shoves the ref into the ropes, and this gives way to nothing as Chris screwed up. Michaels then hits the top rope elbow, flashing lights. I love him, you guys know it, and it was time to tune up the band. He runs into the walls. All there for nothing. The match was in sixth gear at this point. It was looking very bleak for Michaels. Sort of like WWE after Triple H led the brand during this time period. But he reached that rope, much to the chagrin of Chris Jericho, who by the looks of it was crying. Then he walked into an impactful switch in music. Michaels didn't have energy to go for the cover, but once he did, Chris kicked out. They were really spent at this point. But Chris still managed to deliver a super Irish whip before lifting Michaels and essentially screwing himself over as Michaels rolled him up backwards. One, two, three. That's all she wrote. Tremendous stuff. 
Michaels and WrestleMania is the best kind of duel you can ask for. Delivered as expected, and I knew for a fact that I was going to enjoy it again. You know, it's one of those essential WrestleMania matches you watched years ago. It's just one of those matches you just got to visit every once in a while because of how awesome, how amazing the, the action, the storytelling, the feud itself was. Yeah, Chris Jericho was so obsessed with beating Shawn Michaels, and Shawn Michaels, on the other hand, wanted to prove why he's Mr. WrestleMania. Even if there wasn't a story here, the match was still going to be good, but the story itself added. Incredible display from both men. You were enthralled in the story. Chris Jericho just wanted to prove he's better than Shawn Michaels, but he failed. After the match, in tears, Y2J hugged his hero before nakamura in him. Well, we could call it the Chris Jericho because this happened beforehand. Well, you get it. He, he kicked them in the groin. It was all a ruse, and this is the most Chris Jericho thing I've seen this entire week. But yes, a technical textbook match performed to its full potential. These are the type of matches I thoroughly enjoy. Many are under the belief that they stole the show, but for me, I'll wait two hours to make up my mind. To you, they probably did, and by the time this video is up, maybe it was the match of the night for me. In the back, Sullivan visits Mr. McMahon, and meanwhile in the arena, Tony Chimmel announced that WrestleMania 19 set the attendance record in Safeco Field, and then the greatest band from the early 2000s, Limp Bizkit, who I should know is WWE's favorite band, performed Crack Addict, and here we go again. They went all crazy, and I honestly have zero recollection of this. Coach, on the other hand, was focused on the cat fight, and then he introduced the Miller Lite girls when Stacy Keebler interrupted, opted to have a three-way. Tori crashes the party, wanting it to be a fatal four-way, all while JR and Daryl Lara are discussing Tori's Playboy issue. She thought that a Playboy cover girl herself was missing, and so this should be a fatal four-way. Shirts off, they're spanking each other, whatever. The other girls try taking each other's tops off, pillars are thrown, coach falls over and gets pants, and it was almost everything Jerry Lawler could dream of. But now it was time for some serious business. The next match was for the World Heavyweight Championship. Triple H defends the gold against Booker T. Okay, this one, this is the controversial one, why? Well, Booker won the right to challenge for the title in a battle royal. After this, Triple H is like, people like you don't deserve to be champion. Some say people like Booker are WCW, but there was zero mention of that in the promo. Add to that, there was zero mention of that in the Scott Steiner thing, or even the Kevin Nash thing. He made a comment about how Booker T's hair is nappy, told him to dance, and even asked for him to get a towel. Not only that, but even told him to be a chauffeur. Triple H clearly isn't a racist in this story, right? But the build-up made it seem like Booker was going to win the big one. He looked so good in the ring that Triple H and Storyline doubted himself in the weeks leading up to WrestleMania. He didn't know whether or not he was going to win this one. I'll talk about the result afterwards, but with that said, Booker straight up told Hunter that his punk ass is in trouble. Bell rings, purple trunks give me, here comes the bell. Well, the whole event reminds you of that game. Collar and elbow into the corner. The challenger showed much more aggression compared to the champion in the early going. You know, several strikes and chops. Hell, he even had a top rope arm drag. Bump to the post. Take down a little clothesline gives Booker T a near fall. He was pretty relentless, and Triple H had to catch him with a shove to the post. JR Lawler on commentary was sucking on the game's water bottle nonstop to the point where JR had to ask, how much did he pay you? He made a reference to Lawler in a courtroom, <laughs> and in the ring, the game hits a neckbreaker. He begins fighting back, but walks into the double A spine buster. Once he gets up, Hunter shoves him into the corner and delivers this rough ass clothesline near fall again, and the game was in control. At the same time, Booker had these moments where he showed that there was still some fight in him, and there's the DDT. Slugfest leads to a slew of chops from Booker. He was building momentum, but a sleeper by the game slows things down for all of two seconds. The high knee certainly calmed things down. Face bigger from the game accomplishes nothing, and Booker bounces back with a spine buster. Every time Triple H tries fighting back, the five-time WCW champion gets back up or counters a move. Sears's kick wasn't to be. Add to that, the thrust kick was unsuccessful, and on the outside, Flair targeted that left knee by dropping it right onto the steps. Immediately, the game goes for the Indian Deathlock. Booker's leg was in critical condition at this point. If I remember correctly, Hunter used to execute this move a lot during this time period. Correct me if I'm wrong, though. The hold was locked in for about two minutes, but Booker managed to reach the ropes. The leg work still continued despite this, but again, he almost found a way to score that W. Pedigree attempt wasn't to be, and the ref almost passes out. But for the 100th time in the match, Booker's almost got it. He delivers a little forearm and then the scissors kick. Fans go crazy, but his knee's hurting. By the time he reached Triple H, it wasn't enough for the victory. Because of this, he went up top. Flair gets struck. This causes the game to run up there in an attempt to knock down the champion. But he fails, and Booker hits the Harlem hangover. The fans mark out. I love that moment, especially JR's commentary. But again, Flair puts Triple H's foot on the rope. The ref's counting them down, and once Booker gets up, the leg gives way, and this causes Triple H to hit a devastating pedigree. 20, 21 seconds later, he goes for the cover. One, two, three. Fans go crit. What? Well, silent. They're silent. Yeah, this ain't it. The way the story was written, Booker just had to score that W, no matter what. Like, for a guy to say and do all those kinds of things like Triple H did to him, it should have gone down differently. Had Triple H never said that stuff, whatever. Like, even if he won it, it didn't matter. But for the racist to win the end, nah, nah. 
You just shouldn't have happened. JR should have been screaming Booker T, Booker T at the end. And it's very unfortunate how the story was written. They just could have tweaked it like this. People like you from WCW think you'd come in screw you guys or whatever you just mentioned wcw during that promo don't say that other things yeah and then there's people that say oh goldberg was gonna face triple h in the summer well don't have the story be about race just make it a basic story and have him retain well if they're gonna book it this way booker t just had to win in an interview last year booker t spoke about the match i tell people all the time man i don't lose sleep over it or anything like that it's not something that i had to go to be wishing man wrestlemania 19 that night i wish i had it back or anything like that but it was a night that literally could have changed my life in so many different ways admits booker it could have shut up all of the critics it was a built-in story there as well as you know so many people even office guys said man book you should have won that night man you should have won man and i just say man you know i've always been a team player i've always been one of those guys to just go out and do my job and be a part of the team and i never thought about it being about the title or anything like that says booker i just wanted to perform and make you guys happy at the end of the day and at the end of the day, you guys were not happy when I didn't win at WrestleMania 19. So I felt like I let you guys down in so many different ways, you know. So many people like you come to me and say, man, Book, you should have won that night. He isn't all that angry about it, but to this day, many others are. I do believe that if they had Triple H lose it here and eventually to Goldberg in the summer before taking a three-month break, everybody might have looked at him differently. Like, this whole reign of terror thing. Match itself, it wasn't bad. It was actually decent, and as time went on, it was starting to be good. But like I said, that result was very unfortunate, and it just should have gone the other way. Otherwise, people would actually talk about the match quality and the match itself for positive reasons. The next match was 20 years in the making. Mr. McMahon meets Hulk Hogan Street Fight. If he loses Hulk, his career's over. So the story of this one is simple. Mr. McMahon wants credit for making WrestleMania and Hulkamania. Vince was angry over Hogan walking out on him despite the fact that he, Vince, created him. That's what he believes. They even mentioned how Hogan testified against McMahon during the steroid trial. And Hogan didn't believe that he was the right gay guy at the right time. Like, he wasn't lucky or anything like that. He was just that damn good. It was definitely the one with the most promotion out of all the matches. I do find it odd, though, that they promoted a McMahon and Hulk Hogan match rather than the others. And like many said, it might have caused the buy rate to go slightly down. I don't know. Hulk Hogan's song was dubbed, and right out of the game, McMahon slaps Hogan and gets his ass beat. Hulk hits a clothesline and is just choking a strike of the boss. McMahon bounces back with an elbow and a clothesline of his own. Several shoulder tackles in the corner and proceeds to target the left arm of Hollywood's and was just methodical. McMahon got a little in over his head and tested his strength. That took a bit for the Hulkster to finally break, but McMahon opted to low blow him. He was really putting in work to damage that arm, but a steel chair attempt went Ari, and Hogan takes hold of the chair whacking the boss. The blood being drawn took so much out of the boss yeah he was doing bad but then he ducked and hugo savinovich took a chair shot to the head mcmahon delivers a low blow and he's back in another rough chair shot incoming and hogan's the one who's busted open now mcmahon then used the monitor to blast hogan chokes him out before climbing up he even mocked him before hitting a super leg drop Taz was confused over the doctor checking on the announcer rather than the competitor and in the ring mcmahon goes for the cover but hogan kicks out he does it again but is unsuccessful. So he decides to bring in a weapon, and what followed was the million dollar shot. So McMahon slowly ascends from under the ring apron with a smile on his face. The look he's got on his face is as if he's managed to secure another billion dollar deal. But before he can use the weapon, Hulk Hogan delivers a low blow, and all of a sudden, Roddy Piper comes out. This was his first appearance in about seven years. He showed disdain towards both men and was ready to blast one of them. He chose Hogan and the fans booed, but now that Hot Rod was gone, McMahon crawled his way to victory. Except that didn't happen. Why? Because he kicked out. Since the match wasn't done, McMahon tried grabbing the lead pipe, but the ref was showing some compassion. He gets tossed, botched, tossed out, and he waves for somebody. Sylvan runs in and argues with the ref, and in the ring, another pipe shot from McMahon. He hits the leg drop. One, two, no. And this was the moment where Hulk Hogan was revived. He hulks up and so McMahon delivers some strikes. They weren't going to work though. He points at him, you know, you. A right hand to both McMahon and Sylvan. And now that he's gone, Hogan continues where he left off. He hits the boot. And not one, not two, but three leg drops. One, two, three. Well, that was unexpected. You know, if you look at it from that time period, you know, 2003... Everybody thought it was going to be a snooze fest. What actually went down was totally, totally, totally different, and the match was better than it had any right to be. Was it excellent? No, by no means, but it was very entertaining. Both men were in their 50s and managed to put on a worthwhile brawl. Hogan saves his career in a decent match, and Shane McMahon comes out. First appearance since the Evasion story, I believe. He was here to check on his father, but like I said, while it wasn't out of this world or anything like that, it was much better than expected, and I was pretty entertained. The next match was a final battle between The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin. Like Jim Ross said, it's not about titles, it's not about money. 
The build for this one feels abrupt, but who cares? It's Rock Austin for the final time. JR's on commentary and attack WrestleMania. I talked about the build in this video. It's one of my favorites. Then there's this Hollywood Rock video, which is a top five favorite of mine. Yeah, I really enjoyed talking about the match itself here. The Rock comes out. There was just such amazing camera work during his entrance. That shot in itself is one of my favorite of any WrestleMania entrance, and it felt grand. As for Stone Cold, there was another iconic shot there, and I'm under the belief that everyone involved knew that this was going to be Steve's final match. Actually, I believe it was confirmed that... JR, The Rock, those guys were in the know. They knew what's up. Like before, however, a very scary thing occurred to Austin. Because he had a bad habit of drinking a lot of coffee and energy drinks, his heart was beating rapidly until he went to the hospital. It was pretty bad, and the Mania of WrestleMania documentary covered it. It seemed so damn worrisome if I remember correctly. Austin's vest says one more round, which is a clear indication that this was going to be his final match. And both men went face to face, eye to eye. Rock strikes Austin first, but it was his wrongdoing as the Texas Rattlesnake has some aggressive rights of his own. Stunner attempt wasn't to be, and Rock's busy cursing the fans. So Austin brings the fight to him. He whips his ass around the ringside area and tosses him into the steel steps, and in the ring, Austin continues with the stomps, stomping a mud hole, chokes, backdrop, gets an earfall, all while Lawler slick. That's a Hollywood head. That head makes a bunch of money. It wasn't looking good for Rock at this point. He had yet to deliver a single move, and it was about three minutes into the match. And he goes for a child block, and it clearly did a number on Steve's knee. So Rocky connects again, and it was becoming a red target. Austin did show fight, but Rocky was the one who is in control. Then he goes for the sharpshooter and you can hear some boots from the crowd, but Stone Cold reached that bottom rope. Again, he tries sending the leg into the post and then to add insults to injury, literally, he wears Austin's vest, he fights back and even hits a big clothesline. Both men recover and now Austin's got the momentum. He has to loot that press, the double rock was resilient. Jerry Lawler felt that vest was a curse and they bounce off the ropes and this time around, Rock catches him with the clothesline. He kips up but once he turns around, Austin hits a rock bottom, or as I'd like to call it the bookend. Steve measures him for the stunner, but what he got was a stunner himself. Cover, one, two, Austin kicks out. So both men get up after a minute. Rocky delivers these rough-ass rights, but the final shot wasn't to be, and he takes a stone-cold stunner. When I tell you the fans went crazy, it was nothing like any moment previously. Not a moment like that one on this night. But again, the Rock kicked out. He righted the ship with a low blow before going for the Hollywood elbow. He misses and Austin kicks the gut, counters into the spine on a pine, and finally, the jack gets off. He does a retake, hits that people's elbow, but Austin, he just refused to take that L. Rocky sucks, chance intensifies, so he gets serious. He gets the Rock bottom, and surely this is it. One, two, no, it isn't. The look on Rock's face is as if he's seen a ghost. Second attempt gets countered, but he still hit it. One, two, Another kick out. Rock's eyes were fixing to pop out of his head, and at this point, he had enough. This time, he was 200% focused. He catches him. And this image is just like something out of a movie. It's like, this is it. This is the moment where it's finally going to happen. And he plants Austin with a rock bottom. The thud is still stuck in my mind. And Earl Hebner counts Austin's shoulders down the mat. One, two, three. He's done it. But Rock's exercised the demon that is Stone Cold Steve Austin. Incredible moment. Rock then leans over and tells Austin, quote unquote, this is him last year. I whisper to him, I thank you so much for everything that you've done for me. And I said, I love you. He said, I love you too. I hit him on the chest and I left him in the ring. Watching it again, it affirmed why this is my favorite of the trilogy. It clearly wasn't the best that goes to 17 because of the pure insanity. And I even watched it about a week ago again. It really is the best one. This is my favorite. This is the one that I like. This is my favorite one. The Rock showed respect to Austin afterwards, and like I said earlier, the guys in the back, well, a few of them, including Jaron and Rock himself, knew that this was Austin's last match. It was such an incredible way for him to go out, and I just shuddered to think, like, what if Steve Austin remained? We all know he's going to feud with Eric Bischoff. What about afterwards? Like, was he going to face Evolution? I just think it would have been a pretty good program to see Triple H and Austin go at it again. This time, Triple H has Evolution by his side. He faces Randy Orton, Batista, Ric Flair, before facing Triple H at some big event. I think it would have been cool. That's Austin's career, and that's this match. My favorite one of the night. And the main event. Kurt Angle defends the WWE Championship against Brock Lesnar. The rightful main event. This one, despite the issues they had, had the best build out of all the major matches, I'd say. I don't know what you guys think, though. I personally think he had the best story. Brock Lesnar was positioned to be the top guy in WWE regardless of the fact that he was a good or a bad guy. Kurt Angle, on the other hand, was under an insane amount of stress and pain in early 2003. And according to Jim Ross, this match wasn't going to main event. But after Austin was hospitalized, they put this on last. Do I believe that? I'm not sure because I literally heard JR say they gave Brock Lesnar the main event as a reward. Like, we believe in you, we have so much faith in you. Regardless, whatever, I feel this was the best choice for the main event. It was built and teased for several months, but despite all of that, 
The match was so damn close to being cancelled. Kurt Angle spoke about how he almost didn't compete at the big event on his own podcast show. And I quote, At first when I came back from South Africa and I got the diagnosis, I told Vince I'm going to have to have surgery and I'm going to have to skip WrestleMania. He said, I'll call you back. I have an idea. Let me talk to the writers. He decided that we were going to have a match before WrestleMania on SmackDown and I was going to drop the title to Brock and I believe Brock was going to go to WrestleMania, face a new opponent for the main event. I think they were going to substitute Chris Benoit, I believe. He was basically going to take my place and it bothered me. Then a little meeting with his neighbor caused Angle to want to have the match go down. The next day I went to my neighbor's house and there's a really good kid named Johnny. He has Down Syndrome and he said, Kurt, I'm so sad you're not going to be wrestling against Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania. I said, yeah, it's pretty upsetting, Johnny. He said, I wish you would. It stuck with me, so I thought I'm going to call Vince and choose to have surgery after WrestleMania. I called him and said, why don't we have the match at WrestleMania and I will have the surgery, but I'll wait and put it off. I know my arm's atrophied, but another couple weeks isn't going to hurt. So let's have the match. Anyways, this is the first main event with two guys wrestling under their real names. Kurt Angle and Brock Lesnar. Collar and elbows, underhook, wrestling stuff in the very early going. Fireman's carry into an arm lock from Kurt. Lesnar breaks out with a takedown, but Angle catches him with a head scissors. Stalemate. Back at a side lock takeover. Angle's applying pressure, but Brock stops him dead in his tracks with a shoulder tackle. He's like, yeah, I'm that damn good. Angle goes for another takedown, but Lesnar rolls around with a takedown of his own before catching Angle with the arm drag. But it wasn't an issue because he cornered Lesnar and took advantage of that rib cage. He does the same thing with those tackles before running into an elbow and rebounding with a power slam that almost got him the victory. Then all of a sudden, Angle bounces back with a jerk that did nothing to one Brock Lesnar. Commentary teams reminding us that there's no interference and if Angle loses by DQ, or is counted out, title's gone. In the ring, Lesnar shows off his brute strength. Angle catches him with a German onto the turnbuckle. He was applying a lot of damage to that ribcage area, wearing down the Royal Rumble winner. Back suplex gives him a two count. He goes for a vertical, which once again gives him a two count. Angle's plan, it was slowly coming to fruition. Lesnar was under a ridiculous amount of pressure. Fans were trying to rally him on though, and he had to deliver some elbows and even then it wasn't working. Lesnar was fading. After about a minute, he managed to get up and drive Angle into the corners. He was trying to build momentum, but Angle did a number on that back. He was really focused on making good on his plan, and all of a sudden, though, Lesnar caught him with the spine buster. Both men are down. Mike Kyoto's making the count, and it wasn't until the count of eight that both men were on their feet. Some strikes from Angle, whereas Brock went for a couple of knees. So he rakes the eyes and walks into a couple of clotheslines, and suddenly Brock had a burst of momentum. Angle's elbows were no match for the belly to bellies, and this gave him an ear fall. He tries to go for another one, but Angle catches him with a German, another one, and another one. Even I was worn out from him. You can just feel the amount of pain and stress Brock Lesnar was in at this point. The German is one of my favorite wrestling moves. I, I just love seeing a German suplex, especially from Brock or Kurt. He goes for the Angle slam, but it's countered to an F5 attempt. No, Angle catches him with the ankle lock. Even though Brock reached the ropes, Kurt dragged him back and he ended up transitioning into a single leg Boston Crab. This time he makes it to the rope and back to work on that knee. That is until he got back dropped over the top rope. Once he enters the ring, Angle makes a little mistake about Rice the wrong with a ridiculous German suplex. Definitely, definitely my favorite spot of the match so far. One, two, he kicks out. And so the straps are down. Angle slam was to be, but again, Brock Lesnar kicks out. He tries to go for something, but Brock rolls him up and before he knew it, Angle received an F5. One, two, three. He kicked out, crowd was loving it, and following this he plays possum and catches the challenger with the ankle lock. He was desperately crawling, but Angle caught him in grapevine position. It was bad at this point, but this is Brock Lesnar we're talking about. This guy, he's a freak of nature. He forced himself to the ropes, but despite this, the damage was done. F5 attempt was countered, so was the angle slam, but Brock hits the F5 in the end, but he didn't go for the cover, which Michael Cole found eye. So he goes up to the top rope and hits a shooting star press, but lands on his neck. Like, had that spot went down, it was perfect. It would be one of the greatest WrestleMania spots of all time. But hey, you already know that. Brock Lesnar, I don't know what the hell he was thinking trying to go for a shooting star when Angle was a bit too far away. It was an odd decision, and I'll get into that very soon. But anyways, Angle goes for the cover, but Brock kicks out luckily. Like, Angle was very worried that Brock was going to kick out, but he managed to do it. Both men get up, and Angle takes a kick to the gut, and Brock hits the F5. One, two, three. Wow. Yeah, this is my favorite match of the night. <laughs> I honestly didn't expect it to be, but it is. Brock Lesnar almost died. Yeah, managed to wrap this one up. It was excellent technical wrestling. Excellent match in general. Counters, near falls. I'd watch it again in a heartbeat. I knew it was good, and I even watched it about two years ago, but I seemed to enjoy it more than I expected. Superb WrestleMania main event. And I, I just wish, like, this match gets talked about more. It is talked about for the wrong reasons, like the shooting star press. It doesn't hurt the match in my eyes. And, like I said, had it went down, that would have been a highlight. Still is a highlight regardless. Superb stuff. Definitely one of my favorite WrestleMania main events. Top 10. After the match, Lesnar and Angle hugged to end WrestleMania on top. 
During his Kurt Angle show podcast episode about two months ago, Kurt Angle spoke about the decision to have Brock Lesnar go for the Shooting Star Press and the repercussions of it. Yeah, that's cool. You should have been dick. Something like that hitting that hard just straight on your head. What a scary moment. You just didn't know if Brock was going to get up or be able to walk again. It was really scary and those are the chances you take when you do stuff like that. I feel badly because it was my idea and Brock had no plans of doing it and I talked it into him. I, I feel bad about it. I heard John Laurinaitis suggested Brock do it and that's what Angle says. Overall, WrestleMania 19, <laughs> it was awesome. Not even awesome, it was legendary. It's up there with WrestleMania 17. I think this WrestleMania had a better collection of matches. That's what I think. The reason why I feel WrestleMania 17 is better is not just because of the matches, it's because of the feeling that it's the end of an era. It just had that feeling to it, and as evident by the Austin heel turn and all that. And it was, you know, the end of the Monday Night Wars and the end of the Attitude Era. With that said, I'd say 19 had the better amount of quality matches, but 17 had a different feeling to it, and it was the end of the Attitude Era. My least favorite match was definitely the Undertaker and A-Train thing, other than that, matches were decent to good. Booker T should have won. We all know that. He should have won it, definitely. HBK, Chris Jericho, they stole the show. It was definitely match of the night. Austin Rock was a very entertaining affair. The main event was my favorite match of the night, shockingly. Like, I actually didn't expect it to be my favorite. Heading into this one, I thought to myself, oh, it's gonna be Austin and Rock. That's my favorite match. But it's actually the main event. Like I said, I wish it gets talked about more for the right reasons, not because of the botched shooting star press. So, yeah. Where it all begins again. The WWE wanted to commemorate the first WrestleMania by bringing WrestleMania 20 to Madison Square Garden. It's a nice touch. WrestleMania 1 and 10 were held in the same arena, and since then, WrestleMania grew into a much larger name, and the wrestlers each year always reminded you that being on the card was important. WWE in 2004 was in rebuild mode. Austin was kind of around. Rock was a part-timer without the part-timer boost. You know, he was losing some matches, and while things weren't as big as they were in the past, there was nice stuff. The roster was still stacked as hell with the likes of Rob Van Dam, Booker T, Chris Jericho in the mid-card, Kurt Angle, Brock Lesnar, HBK on top, and while the star power on SmackDown side was slowly coming to an end, you know, Brock wanted to go to the NFL, Kurt Angle was injured, Raw on the other side was rolling. Compared to 0204, Ralph 04 to 05 is night and day. Things were moving at a fast pace, the main event matches weren't disappointing, and obviously there's some dumb stuff. But I can say that 0405 Raw is one of the best years the red brand ever had. Youth movement on the other side was in full swing as well. This is a very important WrestleMania for John Cena, Batista, and Randy Orton. On SmackDown, Cena's being the kayfabe PR nightmare with his controversial raps, his disrespect towards authority, and on Raw, you had a confident young upstart who was desperate to prove that he is indeed that good. These three men along with Edge led WWE to a new era of sorts, but here... They were mid cards. With that said, WrestleMania 20 was held in Madison Square Garden on March 14, 2004. 20,000 fans were in attendance to witness the horrendous Brock Lesnar and Goldberg match, and the buy rate was a million and twenty thousand, which was significantly higher than WrestleMania 19's 560,000. The theme songs to the event were Touche by Godsmack and Step Up by Drowning Pool, which was also featured in NFL Street 2, and of course the Punisher movie, which I kinda liked. Don't dunk on me for that. Before the video starts, I'd like to give a mention to a couple of rumored matches from the show. These, these matches range from dream matches to rematches. One of the matches you heard about was Bret Hart vs. Kurt Angle. Around the summer of 2003, Kurt Angle spoke well about the Hitman in interviews. He eventually challenged him for a match at WrestleMania 20, but unfortunately the Hitman was unable to wrestle and declined citing his injuries in the past as the reason why. It's clear that Bret didn't want to be dragged and wanted to do some of the work himself. In other places, Austin and McMahon was considered why? Because it's the 20th WrestleMania. And then there's The Rock vs. John Cena. Apparently this was pitched to the Grey One, but he declined in favor of Mick Foley in the Evolution match. So right now, let's get into it. Before the show started, the boys' choir of Harlem performed America the Beautiful. The intro highlighted what WrestleMania is all about, and the wrestlers showed their passion and ambitions for the show, and it was great. It's definitely one of my favorite intros of WrestleMania. Some of the wrestlers were hanging out in Mankind's home, talking about how WrestleMania is everything, and it concluded with a shot of a new McMahon family member. The commentators for the event were JR, Jim Ross, and Jerry the King Lawler for Raw, Hugo Savinovich and Carlos Cabrera for the Spanish table, and Michael Cole and Taz for SmackDown. The first match on the show was for the WWE United States Championship. John Cena challenged Big Show for the gold. Great way to kick off this show. John Cena's stock was rapidly increasing at this point because SmackDown was getting light on the babyface side and allowed him to slot in and basically be the number two babyface before The Undertaker returned. This had to do with Chris Benoit's departure and the fact that Kurt Angle turned heel. Cena did a freestyle trash in the Big Show saying he's a King Kong ripoff, saying he's itching a beam like a penis with an STD. Hell, he even called him the hippo flow from the Macy's Parade. Big Show didn't need to do no rap. All he did was use his hands, and his title reign was very forgettable. The whole time, the title was on his shoulders, it was never defended, 
And it was ridiculous. And this was John Cena's first WrestleMania after the Sunday Night Heat fiasco with him calling out Jay-Z and Fabulous. He even promised to main event WrestleMania 20, but that clearly wasn't the case. Early on, the challenger was desperate to take out the Giant. He had to use some deceitful tactics, and even then it wasn't enough to wear down the champion. It's weird to hear the entire crowd cheer for John Cena. 100% you know they were rooting for him. Big Show overwhelmed them. Cena's writhing in pain, but this was only the beginning. At least in Big Show's mind. It wasn't letting John Cena rest at all. Once again, he has this little moment, but Big Show knocks him down with a boot. He was dishing it out, but this man refused to stay down. Then he went for the Cobra Clutch, and the fans thought it's time to motivate the champion. That was enough, and the Big Show was reeling. The champion was making more mistakes, and then from out of nowhere, Cena hit the FU. One, two, no. Because the Big Show kicked out, he brought in the steel chain. Ref confiscates it, and boom! Cena hits him with the knucks and hits the FU. One, two, three, new champion. The match is very basic. Big Show never went down once until the FU, and it's not bad, but the action wasn't noteworthy. It's not a match you're gonna wanna watch, except for the moment itself. The moment though where Cena won the title was something special, and to this very day people still talk about it. US title was used well here. They made a star out of John Cena, by the time he dropped it a year later, he was ready for the WWE title. Everybody has their memorable first title run, but John Cena's is near the top of the list for certain. You know, it was a huge moment to see him beat the Big Show and become the champion. Backstage, the coach was asked by Eric Bischoff to look for The Undertaker. Man, the coach was always in some awkward situations. Meanwhile, Evolution stood in the same place where Mick Foley took a kick down the stairs. Randy Orton spoke about how it led to this point and how Foley was initially a coward and that he was perceived because JR was even convinced to call him a coward at one point. I mean, if JR calls you a coward, it's almost factual because he's JR. Orton just wanted Mick to realize that Evolution has passed him by, but even then, he called Hollywood for help. He called The Rock. Despite this, Evolution saw it as a huge opportunity to prove that The Rock and Foley were washed up past their time. Nice promo. The IC title looked great on Orton's shoulder, and it also helped that they treated the title with respect at this point. The next match is for the World Tag Team Championships. La Resistance, Robert Conway, and Rene Dupree, Garrison Kane and Mark Jindrak, and the Dudley Boys, Devon and Bubba Ray Dudley, challenged Rob Van Dam and Booker T for the gold. The champions had one of those early 2000s mashup songs that were forgettable. It'd be like, can you dig it? One of a kind? Whatever the hell it is. Dupree and RVD started off. Van Dam exhibited the athleticism early on before Booker comes in. Booker T followed up and whooped La Resistance's ass. Time for Bubba. They had this nice exchange which led to interference from the others. Bubba broke a pinfall that was already kicked out of, so Jindrak told him to F off. Cade comes in and he doesn't really do much because Dupree's tagged in. Conway follows up and Booker's suffering. He's been in there since the beginning and was paying the price. Van Dam finally tags in and he's untouchable. Almost everybody took a beating except Devon who took advantage of this. The match got messy, everyone's hitting their moves. 1.5D from Devon, a DDT from Conway and after Booker dropped him, RBD hits the 5 star frog splash 1, 2, Three. Eh. The problem with this match is that even though it was eight men, it felt like a regular tag team match at times. The pace should have been fast, you know, tags in and out, chaos. If it were a normal tag match, it'd be kind of decent, but since there was eight men, it's very underwhelming. Come to think about it, RVD and Booker T should have been in something bigger, but it is what it is. The coach caught Mean Gene and Bobby Heen in on the act playing strip poker or something with Mae Young and the fabulous Moolah. Man was horrified, and I bet if it came down to a beating from The Undertaker or this, he'd choose the former. The next match was between Chris Jericho and Christian, a friendship, a bond that was destroyed over a woman. So basically, the story came from Jericho and Christian bidding who could sleep with the woman first. Jericho had Trish and Christian had Lita. Chris Jericho was led far away from Christian to the point where his feelings and thoughts towards Trish far eclipsed that of Christian's. And he ended up clotheslining the hell out of her. So at this point, Trish was more than friends with Chris, Christian was an enemy, and Y2J was out for retribution. This was Christian's second singles match at WrestleMania and was definitely his most important up to this point. Chris Jericho had experience as a single star at WrestleMania having main event of the show and even faced Shawn Michaels a year earlier. He was back to being a babyface after a while and I always say this, but I felt this version of Jericho had potential. The bell rings and they engage in a rough collar and elbow tie-up. Both men were quite lenient and letting go. Why? Because this is what happened. Christian, though, was too aggressive and was sent to the outside. A beautiful springboard from Jericho and back in the ring, he was a step ahead of Captain Charisma who was struggling to figure out a way to halt the momentum. That is until he dropped Jericho to the outside. This caused him to let out all that frustration and piss off the fans. He finally slowed down the pace, but this came with a price. Nonetheless, Christian isolated Jericho and then from out of nowhere, both men bumped into each other. A slugfest ensues which leads to the comeback from Y2J, running in Seguri 1, 2, no. Christian had his moment to steal it, but Chris fought through. Northern Lights leads to the Bulldog and was looking real bad for Captain Charisma. He avoided the Lion Saw and I believe the match was in the final third now. Unprettier counter leads to a reverse tornado DDT from the top, yet Jericho kicked out. He caught Captain Charisma but took a backbreaker. They battle on the top and Christian wins this battle. Crowd's body roll over and Jericho almost steals the match. 
Y2J's knee was proven to be a problem, so Christian took advantage. The Texas Cloverleaf was far too much, but with the fans by his side, he managed to counter into the walls of Jericho. Christian was so desperate to escape, but even though they were on the outside, he continued. A double underhook suplex from the top, and all of a sudden, Trish Stratus comes out. Both men in the ring trade strikes. Christian hits the super impaler DDT, but it wasn't enough. He drags Trish into the ring, and Jericho drops him with a clothesline. He goes to check on her, and she delivers an elbow. Christian takes advantage of the roll-up one, two, three. He finally shines when it matters most. Afterwards, Christian provokes Jericho, and Trish delivers some random ass slaps. Jericho's confused. Fans are shocked, and he takes an unprettier. And to take it a step further, Christian drags her by the head, and they trade tells it. <laughs> Damn good match. I thought I was lying to myself when watching it. I expected something nice, and I thought, this is going to be a great match. It's going to be this and that. But as time went on, it was exactly that match I had in my mind. Christian finally got him a singles victory, a singles moment on the biggest stage, and he needed the win more than Y2J. I will say that the road to getting there though was fun. Both men showed intensity and aggression, and if it defeated well, also provided a twist to the story. Backstage, Mick Foley and The Rock have yet another entertaining segment. The Rock made everything about Mick Foley, talking about how it's his night and everybody knows it. He said that the Hamburglar and Gremis know it, the Superfly and Don Morocco know it, and most importantly, the people know it. He motivated the hell out of Foley, and man, was it electric. Rock is just once in a lifetime. He's a once in a lifetime talent, and we'll get to that soon. The next match was a tag team handicap match. Evolution, Ric Flair, Batista, and Randy Orton face The Rock and Mick Foley. Damn, look at that leap. He leaped higher than a stack of world title rematches from 2007. The feud between Foley and Orton really was special. Randy Orton felt that he was all that. Even though he didn't have much experience, he thought he's the best of the best. One of the ways Orton established himself is by taking out legends. One of those legends was Mick Foley. It got to a point where Foley was lost and walked away, and this was even after Orton spat at him, and others called him a coward. Nonetheless, he bounced back, but even that wasn't enough, so he called the great one. By this time period, both men were on great terms, and Foley was actually shocked that The Rock agreed to this. In the beginning, the babyfaces got rid of the heels, and once things settled down, it was the nature boy and the great one. Both men traded chops and strikes, but The Rock, though, had the edge. Back by, they dropped on the outside, and Foley followed up with the elbow. Randy is tagged in, and he finally got his. Rock gave him a whooping, and Orton had this little moment, other than that, it was all Rock. Even Flair and Batista took a strike. Orton had enough, and Batista enters the match. His power and strength was far too much initially for The Rock, so Flair decided to enter the match. His showmanship affected him, and it didn't help that he went to the top rope. Big Batista saw enough, but even then he took a clothesline. Foley's in. He was too intense, but Batista showed him what's up. Evolution got their hands on him, and once again, Foley was tossed into the steps. JR likened this beatdown to an episode of The Sopranos. The three men finally integrated properly into the match, and Foley was in trouble. He finally caught Batista with a mandible claw, but Orin comes in from out of nowhere. When that happens in WWE games, it's so frustrating. He got the finisher, but somewhat he ruins it. Compared to the others, it was Batista who was struggling with Foley, but at this point, it didn't matter. Rock enters the match, he lays the smack in down, but then Batista came in with a spine buster. So Flair thought it's time to go for the people's elbow. Rock just pops up and continues where he left off, and even finished the people's elbow that Flair desperately sought. Despite this, he kicked out. Orin enters, takes a rock, bottom of Flair makes a save. He's losing and this allows Batista to drop the rock with the Batista bomb. It still wasn't enough. Foley enters, he knocks down everyone before pulling out Mr. Sako. Orin's like F that sock and F you with an R, K, O. One, two, three. Cool. I like this match. It delivered as I expected it to and established Orin and Batista more so. Their stock increased a little after this match with Orton soaring after Backlash. What I like most about this match is that they really wanted to prove to you that these are the guys of the future, especially Randy Orton. I love the showmanship, I love the action, it, it didn't drag at all, I was right. The Rock and Foley looked disappointed afterwards, especially The Rock as he was talking about how this is Foley's night and made everything about him. Unfortunately, this was The Rock's final match for 8 years and nobody expected it to be. Rock was always featured on Raw. If he's gone, they show him in Hollywood at a premiere or what. Not talking about how he's going to star in Walking Tall, Be Cool or whatever. And looking back, it's a shame. Numerous reports and even Rock himself said that he was interested in doing more matches. How The Rock wanted to face Sting at WrestleMania 21. There's even a report that JV on The Rock could have been a title match at the event, but his contract was not renewed, which was questionable. Otherwise, I think we would have seen The Rock versus John Cena a lot sooner, and maybe even The Rock and Shawn Michaels. You know, it's a shame how he left. They should have kept him down, but hey, it is what it is. The 2004 Hall of Fame class were introduced. Bobby the Brain Heenan, Tito Santana, Big John Studd represented by his son. Harley Race, Pete Rose, Don Morocco, Triple H's dad, Greg the Hammer Valentine. Junkyard Dog represented by his daughter, Superstar Billy Graham, Sergeant Slaughter, and Jesse the Body Ventura. This was the first Hall of Fame class. It's not the first official class, but it's the first of the modern era, as we say. This was a stacked lineup, you know. It was very 80s because, well, it was 2004, and the rest was all wrestling in the 90s. 90s were still wrestling. 
a lot of colorful characters there. You know, Harley Race, Tito Santana, Bobby the Brain Heenan, Jesse the Body Ventura, Sergeant Slaughter. So that's cool. The next match is a Playboy Evening Gown match. Sable and Tori Wilson face Miss Jackie and Stacey Keebler. Jackie's out here thinking she's Shawn Michaels stealing the show. And back in the 2000s, WWE had a partnership with Playboy. This led to a bunch of segments at the Playboy Mansion. Of course, every year a woman would feature on the cover during WrestleMania season. Sable, China, and Tori Wilson featured on the cover. The partnership lasted until WWE went PG in 2008. Now, this wasn't no Girls Gone Wild show, but they showed off their attires. The commentary was something else though. Tez apparently stepped cold with his pencil and was ready to take off his clothes. Oh man. The crowd too. The crowd too was something else. The crowd was a little too thirsty as well, you know. The three women took off their clothes and were angry at Jackie. You have Tori, Stacy, and Sable. With Sable, you're probably scared of Brock Lesnar, but it's a different story with the others. As if she had a choice in the end. Tori hit this crossbody before Stacy started to tease everyone with a lex. Stacy and Tori trade pinfall attempts and the crowd was happy at the sighting of a full moon or full moons. The commentary wished they were the ref. Man was loving it, you know, he was getting wrestling in a paycheck and landing on the woman. Tori managed to win it and the moment the match concluded, everything went quiet. Once again, this is a lesson. Pay-per-views in the 2000s were risky. If you're on DVD, all you had to do was skip a chapter, but purchasing a pay-per-view, that's a different story, unless you lived alone. About the match, let's say it was pleasing to a bunch's eyes. The commentary basically showed that a new thirsty type word needs to be created because they were far more than that during this match. Backstage, Eddie Guerrero casts some doubt, aka confidence in Chris Benoit. He fired him up and unlocked that Chris Benoit that could beat Triple H and Shawn Michaels. The next match was a Cruiserweight Classic for the WWE Cruiserweight Championship. Nunzio, Jamie Noble, Tajiri Akio, Funaki, Shannon Moore, Ultimo Dragon, Billy Kidman, and Rey Mysterio challenged Chavo Guerrero. Ultimo Dragon tripped during his entrance. And this feud was initially Chavo and Ring. He lost the title to Chavo in an excellent match at No Way Out. And logically, they'd have a rematch here, but it is what it is. Shannon Moore and Ultimo Dragon started off with some quick exchanges. Both men had an urgency to get something done, but it was Dragon who emerged victorious in this battle. Jamie Noble enters and he managed to tap out Dragon before quickly eliminating Funaki after a crossbody rollover. Nunzio didn't suffer the same fate and instead Noble had to take to the skies. This led to Nunzio getting counted out and he ended up attacking afterwards, so Kidman decided to die in the middle of the air. He just quit in the middle of the air, I don't know how he does. Back in the ring, Noble failed to lock in the guillotine and took a BK bomb from the top rope. Ray Mysterio's in. Seated Senton and off the ropes, he runs into a dropkick. Akio almost cost Mysterio, but even then he kicked out. Ray rebounded with a SOS off the top and Tajiri's in. He proved to be tough opposition, but Ray was in form. Akio apparently couldn't perform because of the mist, and so Chavo's in. Tajiri delivered a cheap shot, and the champion was comfortable, but not for long, though. Even Chavo Sr. took a beating, but unfortunately for Ray, being near the ropes cost him, and Chavo Guerrero retained the title. Nah, this is the most get your stuff in match. Some didn't even have time to do anything like Funaki and Akio. The way the match went hurt the quality, you know, it should have been the Cruiserweight Invitational type match or straight up have Chavo vs. Ray. I think the latter would have been better, you know, too many guys didn't help. Plus, Ray was dressed as Flash, you know, he should have had more time to show off that gear and more time to construct the gray match. The Cruiserweight title was never defended after this, which is not all that shocking because basically WWE didn't care about the division after Rey Mysterio left. 2004 was basically as good as it was going to get from here on. You know, there were some moments, you know, Gregory Helms. Well, other than that, there wasn't much with the Cruiserweight division. The next match was between Brock Lesnar and Goldberg with Stone Cold Steve Austin as the special guest referee. Oh man, a match considered to be a dream match. You have two explosive powerhouses who plow through anyone in their way. Be it a mid-carter, main eventer, and even Hulk Hogan. Can Stone Cold say that? No. That's enough drama as it is, you know, Brock Lesnar and Goldberg. But then it's revealed that Goldberg was leaving after his contract expired. His contract ended after WrestleMania 20 and there was no sign of a renewal. So it was likely that Brock was going to destroy him. Then Brock Lesnar announces he's leaving. Why? It wasn't to go home or anything like that, but to go to the NFL. It sounds random, you know, the man was the number one guy, but he wanted to go play football. It goes to show just how fed up he was, and because of these elements, and because WrestleMania was in what was known as a smart venue, these men got trashed. On paper, this was supposed to be a marquee match, but looking back, it doesn't feel like that at all. Both men were showing part-time energy before becoming part-timers. You sold out chants were loud and clear in Madison Square Garden. Apparently Shane McMahon joined in as well. They are serenading them with a goodbye song, and they did nothing for over a minute. I guess they were thinking like part-timers at the time. Fans resorted to chanting Austin, and at this point, they should have jumped. It would have been better than what we got. There was a collar and elbow tie-up. And this was tight. A little bit of nothing and it was back to the type. At this point in the WrestleMania 33 match, I assume Brock went through the barricade or something. There was no point of return here. They were still in the first parts of the match and were wrestling like they were in an Iron Man match or something. You sold out chance again and they finally do something. Goldberg tosses Lesnar into the ropes before going for that military press slam. 
as he's going for the spear lesnar moves out of the way he goes for the suplex and something's going on in the crowd i believe it was a macho man and hogan fight this match sucks chant intensifies while lesnar's just dishing out slow beating goldberg finally starts fighting back but at this point they lost the fans there was no winning them back at this point they had this little window of opportunity in the beginning but they just decided to stare at each other he hits the spear one two lesnar kicks out goldberg and austin argue and at this point there was a better chance of them hugging than the match being good Lesnar has the F5, Goldberg kicks out. He goes for a spear but runs into the post, leading to Goldberg's spear and the jackhammer. One, two, three. Finally. The problem with this match was for one, the fans gave them no chances. But other than that, it was really dull. Like, this is what Brock and Goldberg had to offer at WrestleMania. They had two moments where they stood on the ring as if it was their first time wrestling. And I ain't talking about together. Then there was this instance where Lesnar had this hold locked in for so damn long. And it was terrible. Afterwards, Lesnar flipped off Austin and took a stunner. Goldberg decided to celebrate, but since he was one, gullible, and two, leaving, he took a stunner as well. So nobody benefited from the situation, and if you consider Austin to have benefited, he left a week later. Lesnar was initially supposed to win, but since McMahon was so pissed over his departure, Goldberg scored the win. It was entirely nothing, just like Goldberg's run in general. You know, he had issues with the guys in the back and wasn't happy over receiving zero bonuses. Or like, oh, we're paying you 1.5 million to wrestle. Why should we give you bonuses? He was angry. The week after he left, he gave out an interview. He trashed the company, talking about how he didn't like how things were, this and that. And it just wasn't a great run for him. It was memorable, but at the same time, it could have been something else. He was wrestling these 15-minute matches, and that. And after he lost the world title, that, that was it. Lesnar, on the other hand, he was their guy. He was their number one guy, and he just decided to leave. Things were crazy back then. Mr. McMahon came out and thanked everybody for making WrestleMania what it has become. The next match was the WWE Tag Team Championships. The world's greatest tag team, Charlie Haas and Shelton Benjamin, the APA, Bradshaw Farouk, and the Basham brothers, Doug and Danny, challenged Rikishi and Scotty Too Hotty for the titles. Right out of the gate, Shelton slapped the hell out of Bradshaw, and man started delivering a beating thinking he's backstage. The Bashams, though, put a stop to it. Scotty Too Hotty and Charlie Haas enter, and Haas didn't do much to combat the champions and needed Shelton's help. Doug Basham ends up tagging in and Scotty was isolated. The Bashams and the world's greatest tag team was doing the work, but it was all for nothing as Rikishi enters the match. With his ass, he sent Shelton back to 2003 and gave Charlie Haas a stink face. The match started to pick up as Bradshaw found momentum and he was sending the Bashams to the outside, giving them a clothesline from hell, but then Rikishi knocked him down and backed his ass on Danny Basham to retain the titles. Similar to the Raw match, this one was forgettable. There was of course something near the end, but other than that, it wasn't much. A vignette for Edge aired. It was expected for him to return on SmackDown, but he ended up coming back a week later on Raw. Jesse the Body Ventura interviewed Donald Trump and started talking about a wrestler in the White House in 2008. Little did he know. The next match was for the WWE Women's Championship. Molly Holly put up her hair to challenge Victoria for the title. Long story short, Molly was the longest reigning women's champion of the 2000s at this point. She loses the title, wants a rematch, but since Stone Cold was around, he wanted her to put something on the line, like her hair. She accepts. As expected, all the things she said is dubbed and they have very little time. Collar and elbow, Molly already gets aggressive. She goes after the arm for a bit before Victoria's athleticism allows her to escape. A little fan was telling Molly to get ready, which was funny. The King was asking if this was the first time Molly would get shaved. Perv. I thought the colon test were something earlier on. The King's out here talking about panties and JR had to steer him back to the match. Victoria makes a comeback. Molly goes around nowhere and someone hits a sunset flip, but she screws up by stealing the Widow's Peak and Victoria goes for the backslide. One, two, three. Eh, they didn't have much time, and the big story was that Molly is losing her hair. She made a run for it, Victoria fouls and almost pays the price and manages to bounce back, and it's Molly who's stuck in the chair. The king called this a butcher job because of the terrible job Victoria was doing, and with that, Molly's hair was gone like her push. She was never the same afterwards, and to get to this moment in itself was something else. In an interview with Ring the Bell, Molly Holly spoke about the links it took for her to get this match. I was a champion and the writers told me that there was only room for one women's match at WrestleMania. They are going to do a pillow fight or a mud match and I was really devastated and thought I gotta come up with something that makes them change their minds. So I put a bald cap on and had my photo taken. I made a booklet with a bunch of different storylines showing my head getting shaved and I presented it to Stephanie McMahon and some of the writers and said, I'm willing to shave my head. Can I please be on WrestleMania? Sure enough, they came back to me a couple of days later and said, all right, we'll let you get your head shaved at WrestleMania. So there you have it. At the end of the day, her hair grew by the end of the year. It just showed how much WrestleMania meant to her, you know, to have a women's match at WrestleMania, not whatever they had earlier on. And it's easily one of the most memorable moments from WrestleMania 20. But on the other side, she was never pushed as hard as she was here. You know, Molly Holly was just ahead and making others look good after this. The next match is the WWE Championship. Kurt Angle challenged Eddie Guerrero for the gold. A story rooted in honor and integrity. Kurt Angle felt that Eddie Guerrero was not the right role model for everyone. Hell, he was a terrible leader for the company. 
So he turned heel. Angle was the perfect foil for the new champion. He was a threat and most importantly an amazing heel. Eddie was well loved at this point. This was a great way to start off his run. Eddie was donning the iconic Scarface shirt, probably his most iconic design. And both men went for the collar and elbow type. Hammerlock leads to a front face lock. Eddie goes for the takedown and Angle follows up. The commentary felt that Eddie should not engage in mad wrestling with Angle. Sure, Eddie's good in that area, but Angle's success needs no mention. Side headlock from the challenger, and he transitions into a takedown, all while the crowd was split. Angle was a bit further, and both men were just clearly testing things. Shoulder knocked down from the champion, he's quickening the pace, and Angle goes to the outside. Eddie and Angle were like pit bulls. One man lifts, and the other is desperate to grab an arm or the head. This suited Angle. Eddie was all about the pace previously. He quickens it, and he has the advantage. That's how it was. With this slow pace, it benefited the challenger. So Eddie had to dig down deep. A knee from Angle, and he's back to work. Abdominal stretch, and it was rough for Latino Heat. He rolls over and connects with a suplex before finding himself in German suplex position. He wanted to hit one on the apron and often I wonder, is that Angle's dream spot or something? Because he's tried it in multiple matches and failed. Eddie goes up top and connects with nobody. It didn't help that his midsection was hurting. So Angle smelled blood. Belly to belly overthrow and Angle's in form. The man was dominant. He goes for another one and it was back to the bear hook. Eddie had to resort to eye rakes and even then Angle completed his hat trick of overthrows. He wanted to top it from the top rope. But Eddie pushed him away and went all out with a frog splash. He screwed up and back to the midsection. Rail showed resiliency and at this point Angle was going with strikes and this motivated the champion to go for a comeback. Felt suplex and is back to the Germans. Angle slam is countered into an arm drag and this unlocks Latino heat. He completed a brace of suplexes but Angle locked in the ankle lock. That wasn't to be and instead he connected with an overthrow premium. At this point the straps were down. He went for the angle lock. Eddie found a way to counter into a roll, but once again, took a German suplex. The angle slam was once again countered into a tornado DDT this time, and Eddie connects with a frog splash. One, two, no. Fans boo because of this, and I gotta say, the match is in the final third now. Angle played possum, leading to the ankle lock. The champion's writhing in pain. Michael Cole's begging him to hang on, and Eddie managed to roll the champion to the outside. He decides to untie his boot, and Angle's ready to take advantage. He's caught. The title slowly come in Angle's way when he randomly pulls the boot. He's confused, and Eddie takes advantage with a roll-up and a foot on the rope. One, two, three. Excellent match. The story was all about integrity, and the match was intensity and intelligence. Intelligence played into the ending. Both men have great matches in their sleep. Even then... Some thought this was underwhelming. Do I think that? Well, do I think WrestleMania 31 was overrated? No. Thing is, Eddie was in form. Angle claims that during his WrestleMania 20 match with Eddie Guerrero, he broke his neck again. This was confirmed two days after WrestleMania, and it looked bad. According to sources backstage last night on Raw, former WWE champion Kurt Angle is experiencing numbness in his hands and will be undergoing tests to see what is causing it. Angle, who has been recovering from the new type of neck surgery that he had last year, will be out of action until they find out what exactly the problem is. With the condition of Angle's neck, Doctors are always very cautious about his condition as it is very important that it does not get worse. The next day though saw some huge news being revealed about Angle's status. The backstage attitude concerning Kurt Angle's recent numbness in his hands is not very optimistic. Many within the company expect that the test will reveal that he will need to undergo surgery on a surgically repaired neck. The situation is being taken very seriously and as most understand that if Angle does undergo surgery again, there is a good possibility that it will be career ending and Angle will be forced to retire. Several people backstage have said that Angle hasn't been his usual happy self backstage and is not in high spirits. The threat of his wrestling career being over has definitely taken its toll on him emotionally. Whether or not Angle chooses to retire remains to be seen. Luckily all was good a while later as Angle had surgery and before he knew he was back to action. So it's cool that they delivered. They had the action, the crowd, and of course the atmosphere. The ending established Eddie as this very unique and intelligent babyface. I mean, how many babyfaces cheat to retain their title, and how many babyfaces fool their opponent like he did here? Not many. Now, once again, Eddie liked this match, but he didn't think it was as good as the fans thought. He did, however, take their word for it. For Angle, it was one of his best WrestleMania matches, and for Eddie, it was definitely, definitely his number one match at WrestleMania. It, it was easy, it's easily his most iconic match. Like when you think of Eddie Guerrero at WrestleMania, this is the match we think of. Angle, it's not even his best match at WrestleMania, which is crazy to think about. And they would continue feuding as time went on. You know, Angle became GM, and I hope we do a video on that eventually. And Eddie went on to feud with JBL. The next match was between Kane and The Undertaker. So The Undertaker was the American badass. This character had run its course and it was time for the dead man to return. Kane was still in the monster run where he was unstoppable, but even he was overwhelmed by the constant teases from The Undertaker. Paul Bear made his return and received a loud cheer, but that was nothing compared to the moment The Undertaker came out. It had been a very, very long time since the fans saw this version of him. Kane was like the 04 Lakers. 
He was done before the match even began. He refused to believe the Undertaker was here, but that certainly made him believe though. Kane was overwhelmed as was the referee who ran out of there like he saw hell. Apron, leg drop, and back in the ring. Kane is taking a beating, but he manages to counter the last ride. The ref was running inside and outside the ring more than a mid-card heel, and Kane connects with a flying clothesline and trade strikes with the dead man. He grabs the arm, attempts old school, but Kane grabs him and manages to hit the choke slam. He finally resolved the issue. Kane was gonna beat his brother. At least that's what it looked like because Taker sat up. And this was the moment he realized he was screwed. He hits that flying clothesline, choke slam, and it's time for the tombstone. One, two, three. Not bad. I honestly didn't have much hopes for this one. Last time I watched it, I didn't really like it, but now it was way better than I expected. The Undertaker was once again established as this almost unstoppable dead biker, whatever the hell he was. It was cool. The visuals were amazing. The entrance The Undertaker did, iconic. Everything about it was memorable. The Undertaker was back, and it was something special. And the main event, Triple H defends the World Heavyweight Championship against Shawn Michaels and Chris Benoit in a triple threat match. It's time for that match. Chris Benoit in 2003 established himself as the guy to watch in 2004. Every time he challenged for the title, it seemed like he was winning. The fans got behind him here and Benoit was a perfect guy to win the Rumble. He jumps ship to Raw and Shawn Michaels has a problem. His ego gets in the way and he signs a contract that was intended for Benoit. That's a different story, but it leads to a triple threat match. The promo for the match itself was excellent. One of the best from that era. Triple H around here was starting to pick up after a very bad 2003. He was injured, not in shape, but here that's a different story. And it also helped that his opponents in 2004 were from Scott Steiner and Kevin Nash to Chris Benoit and Shelton Benjamin. Oh, he wasn't clean shaven anymore, which was essentially a curse, and he donned the white boots in special matches such as this. So the bell rings and both challengers have an issue already. They wanted to beat up Triple H. Benoit almost locks in the cross face, but instead delivers some chops. Triple H goes to the outside and the challengers go at it. Northern Lights suplex and from out of nowhere, Triple H delivers a clothesline. To the outside, Benoit goes and it's back to the game in HBK. You screwed Brett, Chance intensifies the game, goes to the knee. The original main event battle and HBK ruins it like you ruined the original match and back to DX. Not for long though as Benoit re-enters the match. He shows off intensity and sends Shawn Michaels into the post. Snap suplex and is back to the chops. The game grabs him in tree of woe position and sends Michaels directly onto him. He gets his though but it's not enough for the victory. Off the ropes Michaels connects with a forearm before Benoit sprints and sends him to the outside. He goes to the German suplex and the man was hard headed. He refused to let go and completed the hat trick. He gets carried away superplex from the top and it gives Triple H the near fall. Both men attempted their finishers and Triple H was desperately trying to escape but he's caught. Shawn Michaels had to come in. But Michaels got his though with a hat trick of German suplexes. The headbutt almost gives Benoit the victory, but Michaels is still in. There's the forearm and it's back to DX. HBK goes for the comeback. He hits the elbow and it's time to tune up the band, but the fans were anything but happy. Sweet chin music, one, two, Benoit drags the game out. He battles Sean before catapulting him into the post and he's bleeding. Benoit caught him and locked him in the cross face, and Michaels was basically tapping, but Triple H grabbed that arm. Somebody finally got a hold of the rabid Wolverine and dropped him through the announce table. This was his own doing as DX teamed up to take him out. You know, he wanted to drop Triple H and ends up paying the price. This is what HBK wanted, and it was time. Michaels overwhelmed Triple H here. He was going for strikes, a super Irish whip, and he was going all out. But then Triple H hit him with a pedigree. Both men were down. They were cut. They bled profusely, and it seemed like all was over, but Chris Benoit was here. He still had something left and locked Triple H in the sharpshooter. I think if you asked the crowd, they would have wanted this match to end here. For Triple H, this was hell. He was moving around like a fish on land, but it wasn't for too long as Shawn Michaels hit the sweet chin music. Even then, Benoit kicked out. He tries going for it again, but Benoit throws him out. Triple H catches him, and it looks like the match is over, but Benoit counters at the last moment, and the crowd explodes. The game is caught, and even though he was slowly fading, the rope was near. All he had to do was pull his arm out, drag the rabid Wolverine with all his fiber being, but even then, Benoit dragged him to the middle of the rink. He's bleeding. He's spent, and he taps out. Fans go crazy, and wow, what, what, what a tremendous main event. It delivered from every area. Now, would a Triple H and Shawn Michaels match be good at the main event? Yes. Would a Triple H and Chris Benoit match deliver in the main event? Definitely. But the added element of the third man makes this, in my opinion, the greatest main event in WrestleMania history. The action flowed well. The man they were pushing looked so dominant. I mean, this man took so much damage, yet came back with that chop and the German suplexes up and down. HVK drops him. He's back with the German suplexes. They throw him through the announce table. He's back. He was treated like a big deal and the others made him look great as well. They were selling his moves well. 
treating the cross face like it was the most threatening move they ever been locked in there's not a single dull moment in here i mean it got to a point where hbk teamed up with a sworn enemy to take down this man just for a moment i can't really explain why this is the best wrestlemania main event you just have to watch it the story the action and the atmosphere will all in display here Triple H finally got a great WrestleMania match, a main event that wasn't ruined by interference, card positioning, or a controversial ending. Shawn Michaels did what he does best in Chris Benoit, it was the single most iconic moment of his in-ring career. JR was close to dying on commentary and he couldn't exaggerate how big of a moment this was. It was just that. This man went through so much to get here and there was his best friend Eddie Guerrero. It's a very touching moment, these two men bled together, cried together, and never in anybody's wildest dreams did they envision a moment where these two stood together as the world champions in the main event of wrestlemania wow now obviously we gotta mention that this is somewhat tainted i'd like to look at things from a 2004 perspective you know when we gotta think of that moment everybody loved this guy everybody wanted him to win the title and the moment itself it's easily one of the greatest moments in wrestlemania history is it now no that's a different story i don't have a hard time watching his matches but there's always that thought. As time goes on, it gets a little weirder to watch Chris Benoit, especially in 2007. His matches in 2007 are very odd to watch. This one, it wasn't that much, but you always have that thought in the back of your mind. That's how it was for me. But yes, this is easily the greatest WrestleMania main event of all time for me. Overall, WrestleMania 20 was surprising for me. Now, I already liked this event, but it kind of grew on me. I thought it was a bit overrated, but I hadn't watched it in eight years. So watching it now, I changed my opinion on it. Yes, it's a top five WrestleMania for me. It's one of my favorites of all time easily. The problem with the show, though, the time, the length of it. It's four and a half hours, and if they cut a few matches, it would have been amazing. The matches that should have been cut, those were the disappointing matches. Rock and Goldberg is another one. That match sucked. It looked like they were wasting time like it was a Champions League match or something. The opener was exciting to see John Cena win the title. Not the action itself, but it's cool to see Cena, you know, rise up. You're seeing this young guy, you know, he's becoming a star. Evolution versus The Rock and Sock Connection was great. I loved the showmanship in the match. We had these guys showing off, doing all that. It was cool. The tag matches are like, eh. But the show found form. Eddie Guerrero and Kurt Angle come in. They put on a classic. The Undertaker comes in. Everyone goes crazy. Then there's the main event. You know, it's easily one of the best WrestleManias of all time. It grew on me after watching. I was like, this is that damn good. It actually delivered more than I expected it to because I hadn't watched the matches in a while. But it was cool. 2005, the year JR got fired and his ass was exposed to 6 million people on live television. 2005, the year Matt Hardy got cheated on and effed over. 2005, the year Orlando Jordan lost title matches quicker than Jinder Mahal's push. And you may be thinking, oh, that year sucked. But it was quite the contrary. Why? Because for one, we had to see new blood in the main events. Reign of Terror was finally over. SmackDown vs. Raw 2006 came out, and I've yet to see a game come out with better gameplay. My favorite is 07, though. And I'm under the belief that 2005 was pretty damn good, and that's just for WWE. Because if we're talking about Ring of Honor, there was Samoa Joe and CM Punk, TNA, the X Division. Ah, you get it. 2005 was cool. This WrestleMania was the beginning of something special. Two superstars of a new generation finally given the keys to the kingdom. Cena got SmackDown, and Batista got Raw. And if you compare it to previous years, it was very... Very fresh. Those two aren't the only ones getting pushes. There was Randy Orton and Edge. And the WWE is finally getting over that hump from 02 to 04. You know, the struggles of Austin and Rock leaving. 2005 was actually the first year they turned a profit over. You know, the investment in the prototype and Leviathan was finally paying off. With that said, WrestleMania 21 was held in the Staples Center on April 3rd, 2005 in Los Angeles, California. 20,193 were in attendance to witness history being made. AK Big Show showing his ass cheeks and the buy rate was 1,090,000. Wow. It was a bit higher than WrestleMania 20 and at the time was the second most purchased WrestleMania event. The theme songs to the event were big time, ironically 22's theme as well, by the soundtracks of our lives and behind those eyes by three doors down. Also, a game was made for the Xbox and it was based on WrestleMania 21, but it didn't even feature the arena itself. It was WrestleMania 20. The game looks aesthetically pleasing, once you get to know it, actually play the damn thing, it sucks. But WWE took advantage of the fact that they were in Hollywood and made a bunch of trailers. So well, they parodied a bunch of movies. JBL stood on the Few Good Men one, you know, shouting, You can't handle the truth. Pulp Fiction one was iconic with Eddie slowly opening up that briefcase and discovering what they call WrestleMania and friends. There was Brave Hearts with Triple H, and then there's the best one. The Taxi Driver one, you know, are you talking to me? Big Show's jacket was getting ripped up. A mic falls while he's doing his best Robert De Niro impression. You talk to me. It was some good stuff. Now that I've set the stage for one of my favorite WrestleManias, even got the DVD, let's get into it. 
Okay, Lillian Garcia started off the show with America the Beautiful. USA chants intensify, and it was time for the intro. They showed off the trailers, and damn it, they dubbed the music again. Before the show officially kicked off, there was one final trailer to show. A Gladiators parody featuring Stone Cold Steve Austin. You know, he's talking about how he's the chief ass whipper of sorry SOBs, and the best part was when he takes off that helmet, reveals his name, and says that tonight, he unleashes hell. Pyro goes out, commentary teams introduce themselves, and it's time for the first match. Eddie Guerrero meets his tag team partner, Rey Mysterio. Oh man, this was a first WrestleMania. Tag champs facing it off. These two guys are some of the all-time greats, you know, Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio. They had some classics down in WCW, but this time it was going to happen on the biggest stage, WrestleMania. The story of this matchup was simple, you know, Eddie wanted to know if he can beat Ray. Obviously that would turn into something else, but at the moment they were good buddies. Also check out this video. 2005 was the start of something special for Rey Mysterio, you know, he was marketable, had superb matches, and WWE felt it was time to push him to the next level. Was it deserved? Hell yeah. Anyways, as the bell rings, Eddie chants intensify, side headlock takedown from Guerrero, fireman's carry counter, awesome. Ray was trying to pick up the pace, whereas Eddie was trying to pick the arm. Some grappling leads to a catapult to the outside, little trickery from both men, and it's a stalemate. And they're like, damn, you're good. Both guys were evading each other, it was Ray that won this battle. Eddie bounced back with a strike before diving over the top rope and in the ring, he goes back to work on that arm. Fans ran the Mysterio on, but Eddie quickly puts a stop with a backdrop targeting that right shoulder. He goes for the surfboard and it was doing some work, but he almost pinned himself in the process. STF from Guerrero and things were slowing down at this point. Once again, the fans tried getting Ray back into it. He did find an opening and sent Latino Heat out of the ring. Then he proceeded to hit this impressive corkscrew plancha over the top rope and damn do I love that spot. It was superb. In the ring, he hits the senton, and just as he builds momentum, elbow from Eddie. He attempts the three amigos, but only gets one as Ray once again countered into a pinfall attempt. Backbreaker before another three amigos attempt. He hits two this time, but Ray evaded the third and almost hit the 6-1-9 before walking into a brutal, tilted world backbreaker. He once again spammed the suplexes, but this time it worked. Frog splash wasn't to be as Ray Mysterio rolls out of the way. And once both men recover, they quickly try rolling each other up. Drop toe hold, and boom! 619. As he goes for the West Coast pop, Eddie power bombs him, but that wasn't enough. And I just loved how the commentary marked out for that one. They really made you believe that it could be it. Crowd, once again, incredible. Both men get up, and Ray runs into a tilted world. Nope, he rolls Eddie up. One, two, three. Wow. You know, I haven't watched this in several years. Going into it, I thought it was going to be below expectations. But if this match happened to involve two others, it'd be appreciated more. Since these two are all-time greats, it's a good match. But yeah, like I said, going into it, I was expecting something else. Like, some people were like, oh, this match was disappointing, whatever. And I get it. Like, you see Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio, you expect some sort of five-star classic. This wasn't that, but for an opener to WrestleMania, with the time they were given, it was a great opener. Crowd was into it, commentary added to it, and both guys were awesome. Rey Mysterio once again beat Eddie Guerrero, and he had to swallow his pride to shake his partner's hand. Like I said, great opener, I loved it, even though you expect more from these guys. In the back, JBL finally meets Triple H. They insult each other, Triple H pokes fun at him, telling JBL that he should keep telling himself he's good, and somebody will believe it. Flair woos at Jordan, and both champs were expecting the other to lose their belts. JBL was a heat magnet, Triple H was hated for his actions at to that the reign of terror and stuff, and this was the perfect stage for them to lose the belts. The next match was Money in the Bank. Chris Jericho, Chris Benoit, Chris Tin, Shelton Benjamin, Edge, and Kane Chown for the right to hold that briefcase. Now, you may know that Chris Jericho invented this, right? But then again, he invented WrestleMania, the word mark, everything. It was supposed to be this thing called the Hollywood Dream Match. You know, winner gets to fulfill his dream. RVD would have won it and he would have brought back ECW. He got injured. Add to that, they tweaked the idea into Money in the Bank. Winner gets the opportunity to challenge for any title for up to one year. World title, I should know. Anyways, right out of the gate, the guys tried jumping Kane. You know, they knew the biggest guy in WWE world had the best chance of winning. Benoit and Benjamin ended up suplexing him on the outside. Captain Charisma tried stealing the match, but Jericho slammed that ladder directly into his face. He gets to do it with Shelton before dropping in the Canadians. Crossbody, springboard from Christian, while Benjamin puts their dives to shame and to top it all off. Kane hit a clothesline off the top. He proceeded to use the ladder as a weapon, only to walk into a missile drop kick. Jericho then uses that as a weapon. I always chuckle when he drops it on edge like trash. Benoit comes in with a German sending Y2J in the ladder all the way back to 2004. Chris Cross faces anyone in sight before a ladder catches him above his right eye. Then Kane destroys his arm before walking to a spear, and all of a sudden it's an E and C reunion. Shelton reminds everyone that he's a part of this match, and damn, it just didn't slow down. 
You blink and you essentially miss a big spot. Shelton had a flapjack, a finger splash. He climbs up top, but Chris and Chris didn't return. Another ladder sat up, and all the men were up top, and they obviously crashed and burned it in Edge's case. He got T-boned. Shelton was a highlight reel on this night. Look, he's a highlight reel in every ladder match he's ever been in. And if that wasn't enough, he sprinted up a ladder and clotheslined Chris Jericho right off the top. And it was one of the most impressive spots of 2005, bar none the most memorable spot of the match for me. This thing was so damn good, made its way to the Raw intro, and man, I, I just love Shelton Benjamin. This guy was a freak of nature. As he tries to retrieve the briefcase, Christian blasts him into top it all off. Kane unmercifully tried choke slamming him onto the ground. Luckily, saved by the ropes, Tomko tries aiding Christian only for Kane to ruin everything. And it was incredible. Meanwhile, Kane and Jericho fight atop the ladder, but neither man succeeded. Chris Benoit returns, and instead of winning, he slowly climbs out to the top of the ladder and hits a headbutt that busted him open. His arm was hurting, but he was going to retrieve that briefcase come hell or Kane. Same thing, he forcefully fought off a big monster, and just as he's got the briefcase, Heat Magnet Edge blasts him with a chair. The boos were loud in the Staples Center, and he steals it. Okay, that was a superb showing. Money in the bank to this day. In my eyes, this one has yet to be topped. It was a 20 minute highlight reel. There was never a dull moment. Edge winning was the best choice, probably. But had somebody else won, it wouldn't have been bad. His character at this point was sort of deranged compared to the Radar R Superstar thing. Without Lita, he was kind of going crazy. He was completely obsessed with the title, and that's what caused him to turn heel in October and storyline. And he was just poised to win that briefcase. Like I said, the best Money in the Bank match. It's one of my favorites. It's probably my favorite, along with the 2019 one where Finn Balor almost died. Andrade also almost died. Yeah, it's definitely the best one, and it's just crazy to think that this one, 16 years later, has yet to be topped. Well, in my opinion. Eugene then came out talking about King Kong, Bundy, and WrestleMania when Mohammed Hassan came out. He was angry over being excluded from the biggest show of the year, and then he proceeded to insult LA and Hollywood, saying that's got a profound history of bigotry. Add to that, he had to take a backseat to a disgrace like Eugene. He's going to create a WrestleMania moment himself. Boom, Eugene gets attacked. Boos intensify, camel clutch, and there's no hope for Eugene, but then real American plays in the crowd's unglued. They try to make the attack, but Hogan was still 99 overall in 2005. Hassan was being from pillar to post. Navari tries using a chair, but he forgot Hogan was impervious to jobber pain. And out he goes. Eugene's nowhere to be found, and for the next five minutes, Hogan celebrates. He was riding high at this point, with Hogan knows best being released a few months later. Add to that, he made his return and showed HBK how to play politics so there's that. It wasn't the last we've seen of Hogan on this night. The next match was between Randy Orton and The Undertaker. Oh, this one, man. It has been a while since I watched. It was the start of something special, you know, Undertaker and WrestleMania. His matches were must-see because there was the streak. Also, this was around the time period where they began talking about the streak a lot. And it was a huge, integral part of this storyline. The Undertaker was 12-0 at this point, and Randy Orton, after some advice from superstar Billy Graham, tried to go where no man has ever went. Because of this, he was slowly turning into a heel. He arc healed Stacey Keeler in the most legend killer way, you know, he kissed her and boom, delivered it. Cowboy Bob Oren got involved and felt that his son was getting out of hand, and even begged The Undertaker to have mercy for him. Orton was really pushing Taker's buttons, and it was a great storyline. Also, I should note that WrestleMania was only the beginning of it. Another special WrestleMania entrance for The Undertaker and for Randy Orton. He was doing good, but at the same time, he was trying his best to ruin everything. Why? Well, he missed the rehearsal for this matchup. Everybody, including his father and The Undertaker, were there waiting for him. And watching Untold, you can see just how much he regrets that moment to this very day. He thanked The Undertaker for not holding it against him, and I'm glad that he managed to change following all of this. Obviously, it took him two more years, but better late than never, right? So the bell rings. Orin tries evading the dead man, and he didn't want to be cornered, and boom, he slaps him. Side headlock, leapfrog, beautiful drop kick gets him a two count. He goes for a back body drop, and all this jumpy jump was for nothing as the dead man strikes. Orin was quick, though. He wasn't going to be cornered. RKO attempt to go south and back, and the ring taker hits the apron leg drop. He then connects with old school, and Orin was in deep trouble. He realizes this and drop kicks his opponent off the apron and into the barricade. Back in the ring, the Legend Killer finally takes control, but it didn't last long though as Taker hit the DDT. Bump off the turnbuckle into the sidewalk, slamming again, it's a two count. The Undertaker was just bouncing the youngest world champ around the corners, but he quickly knocked down the dead man with an elbow. Orn delivers some rights, but he sets up. So, he continues the attack. Randy sucks, chant intensifies. Taker fights back, and it's a slugfest. Rights and lefts until Taker hits the clothesline before applying the Dragon Sleeper. It seemed like the hold incapacitated Orin, but he quickly countered with a DDT. This didn't get him the win, though, so he quickly went for the chin lock, and after another attempt, he gets backdropped. Both men recover, fans rally Taker on, and he bumps off the ropes, only to run into a power slam. In the corner, he delivers several strikes, he shows off, and it cost him? Nope. Last ride goes south, as does the RKO attempt, and the ref's not down. Taker goes for it again, and it kind of works, and all of a sudden, Hall of Fame Daddy runs in there with a cast and knocks out the Undertaker. 
He drags his son over him. Earl Hebner crawls towards them. One, two, no, he kicks out. Fans are going crazy and ask for Bob Orton. It's like he forgot to defrost the meat or something. And Orton, just to quote a familiar song, you're gonna pay, you're gonna pay. I'll see myself out. Father gets knocked down and it's time for the choke slam. Nope. R K O. Fans go insane. Earl Hebner counts one. Two, he kicked out again. Wow. All of a sudden, Orton decides to commit gimmick infringement by stealing Taker's taunt and attempting the tombstone. It gets countered. Orton tries fighting out, but there's nothing to do, and boom, he's on the receiving end of the tombstone pile driver. One, two, three. Another match delivers. <laughs> The Undertaker was 13-0 at WrestleMania, despite the fact that Orin lost, he looked so damn good out there. Rumor has he was supposed to win, but out of respect for Taker turned down the opportunity. Couldn't find a citation on that, but that's what I've been hearing for years. The choke slam counter into the RKO will definitely stand the test of time. Performance definitely sticks out to me as an important chapter in Orin's WWE career. Why? Because after the failed heel run, Orin was really struggling. You know, he needed some fire and momentum, and that's what he got after WrestleMania. Once he returned, he feuded with The Undertaker, had three good to great matches, Hell in the Cell's underrated, and he was back on track. Sure, there was a little setback with the whole Rey Mysterio thing and him smoking a joint backstage, but he was doing way better than he was in 2004 after losing the title, and had his behavior allowed it, he probably would have been world champion then and there. Kudos to both men for an incredible performance, I was thoroughly entertained, you know, or stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with The Undertaker and almost came out on top. It was probably the best Undertaker WrestleMania match up to this point. Might be a hot take, but that's what I'm gonna say. I just enjoyed watching this one a bit more than the Triple H WrestleMania 17 or the Ric Flair WrestleMania 18 ones, but for you, you might be either one of these three. Hell, it might even be the Kane match at WrestleMania 14 where he kicked out of three tombstones. But yeah, my favorite up to this point has to be the Randy Orton bout. The next match is for the WWE Women's Championship. Christy Hemi challenges Trish Stratus. Okay, this one is odd to me. By the looks of it, they're gonna have Trish challenge Lita, but those plans never came to fruition because she got hurt. Hemi was the Diva Search winner, was on the front cover of Playboy, but all of this would quickly come to an end by December of 2005. Trish came out all Hollywood, and initially she did try schooling the challenger, and by the looks of it, she wasn't taking this match seriously. It was all a joke to her, but then the chick kick wasn't to be, and she was low blowed. Unorthodox pinfall attempt from Hemi, all while Jerry Lawler was wondering where she got her wrestling gear. She showed some flexibility, hit a sunset flip, but again, Trish put to stop with a tackle. Same thing happens. Christy builds momentum with a roll-up. Some kicks repeatedly slams the champ into the turnbuckle. Twist of fate is successful, but Trish kicks out, and she was relentless on the assault. Roll-up counters from both women, and once they get a boom, chick kick. One, two, three. Lita had a disappointed look on her face, and Trish retains. It was essentially a foregone conclusion. Christy didn't really look bad out there for what it was, and it was quick. Trish retained and had this little thing with Viscera, which I'll eventually dive into. So yeah. The next match was between Shawn Michaels and Kurt Angle. Wow, am I glad to be watching this one. Why? Well, the last time I did, I had two videos on this channel, if I remember correctly. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that I haven't watched this in a long time. So the story of this one was simple. Kurt Angle wasn't proud of the fact that people thought HBK was better than him. It's a belief that he's had since 1996, and in his eyes, it was an insult to himself and everything he stood for. Angle attacks at the Rumble. HBK fights back a few weeks later after making the challenge. Sexy Kurt occurs, which is probably the most hilarious thing Kurt Angle has ever done. But at the same time, he was vicious. Shawn Michaels was left a bloody heap. Sensational Sherry was attacked, and it showed that Angle was poised to win that match. It's a dream match, and ever since Shawn Michaels returned in 2002, their paths had yet to be crossed. It was a long time coming, and to say they met those expectations during this night would be a massive, massive understatement. I already talked about the feud in this video, but this is where I'm going to talk about the match itself. If you didn't know, Shawn Michaels debuted his leather chaps here, and he would never go back to wearing tights. Also, I still don't get why he and Kurt Angle never had these attires in SVR 2006, but whatever. We're talking about WrestleMania 21 here, not SVR. And it was time. Both men went face to face, eye to eye. The bell rings, and damn am I hyped. HVK makes it seem like he's going for a collar and elbow, but does the most HVK thing ever and slaps Angle, who responds with a takedown trying to mat wrestle Shawn Michaels. In Jerry Lawler's eyes, that was an odd approach due to the fact that Angle's like the GOAT wrestler. He's like the best pure wrestler in WWE at this point. He proceeded to go for the side headlock, and Angle's trying to free himself with Shawn's very persistent. Even took a back suplex yet kept the hold locked in. Little shoulder tackle and it's back to the same predicament and oddly enough he was finding success with this strategy. Angle slowly being pushed off his game and for the third time HVK goes for the side headlock takeover. Angle finally breaks free after pulling the hair but gets a hip toss. A little hold. 
and in JR's eyes, he felt as if Angle didn't really focus on Matt wrestling, and that's his explanation as to why he's still stuck in this predicament. He once again lifted HK only to find himself being pinned to the mat. Backslide transitions into the side headlock again, fourth time I believe. This is my favorite part of this chapter of the match. So Angle is annoyed over the fact that HBK dominated him with a mad wrestling, right? So he tries forcing it into a fight rather than a technical match. And because of this, the match kicked into second gear. Angle quickly goes for the ankle lock, but HBK evades and clotheslines Kurt over the top rope. He clears the announce table only to walk into several uppercuts. Suplex attempt wasn't to be, but Angle managed to ram that back into the steel post. So now Kurt Angle is going to focus on that lower back, knowing HBK is passed. High suplex gives him a Two count and he was grounding the heartbreak kick. Body scissors applying pressure on that lower back and Michaels actually managed to get back up and deliver several chops. Orin rights the shit with a rough Irish whip before finally connecting with the belly to belly. It worked out so well that he executed another one and after targeting that back, both men engage in a slugfest of sorts until HBK slapped the taste out of Angle's mouth leading to a clothesline. And damn, just look at how angry that guy was. He tried going for something on the top only to fall on his back and as HBK goes for the elbow, nobody's home and so the straps are down. Angle Slam is countered into an arm drag and Kurt gets way ahead of himself and is thrown over the top. Crossbody, he tries re-entering the ring only for Angle to come in and attempt a German of all moves. Because of this, Michaels desperately low blowed Angle, and that's one of the reasons why I like Shawn Michaels. Why? Well, he wasn't the best morally and it showed here. He wasn't a clean cut good guy. Here, he was desperate and decides to low blow Kurt. He pushes Angle away and hits a springboard crossbody right onto him, but the table never gave way. Once they're back in the ring, Angle's bleeding from the mouth and another slugfest. Actually, it was one-sided. Flying forearm, the kip up, and some fans are booing. He begins the comeback, atomic drop, body slam, and HBK goes up top. This time it works, and it was time to tune up the band. That wasn't to be because Angle blocked it into the ankle lock. Fans are going crazy. Michaels was trying to force himself out of it, but it wasn't working. He was desperately reaching for that rope, and it took a while for him to reach it, but he finally did it. Kurt Angle goes for another angle slam, but HBK leads himself back to the ankle lock. He managed to escape this time around when a sweet chin music was countered into the angle slam. One, two, no. Angle is getting frustrated, so he pulls the straps up again only to take them down and hit a moonsault on John Cena. Also, why does this guy hate Shawn Michaels? Like, did he do something to him in the lobby? He goes up top only to receive a top rope angle slam. Fans think it's over, but it wasn't. The Olympic hero because of this was raging, and so he began shouting at Shawn Michaels, and it bit him in the face as Michaels super kicked him. Once he crawls towards Kurt after like a minute, he kicked out, and after that, he looked out of it. He looked completely lost, and it was a huge mistake, because Angle was playing possum, and this time around, he locks the ankle lock and was stuck in the middle of the ring. He was holding on like his life depended on it. Add to that, whenever Michaels was close to reaching the ropes, Angle drags him right back in, and then he grabbed Vine the leg and that was it whatever HBK did he was stuck contemplating whether or not to tap the crowd was thinking it's over but he still held on but in the end he took enough pain and so Shawn Michaels tapped out I take back what I said during the WrestleMania 25 video you know I said something along the lines of Bret Austin and the Undertaker HBK matches were the greatest in WrestleMania history well this one's up there with them it was an incredible display on the biggest stage of them all they started off with the technical stuff HBK beat Angle at his own game causing him to force it into a fight and from there they showed exactly why they were two of the very best in the business and yes this match was five stars it's gotta be you had the atmosphere action everything it was glorious and I can't say anything bad about it for sure it's match of the year 2005 otherwise I'd be smoking something if I said it it wasn't. Man, it was ridiculous in the best way possible. On the Kurt Angle show last month, Kurt Angle spoke about this matchup with Shawn Michaels. And I quote, Wrestling Shawn was a dream come true. Going into it, we ended up having the story. The Angle started at the Rumble now so excited because when I first saw Shawn wrestle at Survivor Series a couple of years prior, I had never watched him wrestle before, so the first time I was in awe. It came down to him and five guys on the other team, and because it was elimination, he went through those five guys. He didn't win and lost at the very end, but he eliminated four of them. The way he's sold, his technique, his charisma, Sean is without a doubt the best overall performer I've ever seen. Okay, I don't want to fill this part of the video with quotes, but Angle claims Vince left it up to himself and Michaels to determine who wins it. HK felt that since Angle is going to have a program with Batista, then he should win it. Also, come to think of it, it's a damn shame we never got to see Angle versus Batista, like a full-on program. I feel Angle would have brought out the very best in Batista. Like, that guy, he knows how to work wonders with talent. Knowing very well that no damn match was going to top that, Rowdy Roddy Piper hosted the Piper's Pit with his guest being Stone Cold Steve Austin. So, two faces of two generations. The bad guy, the anti-hero of the mid-80s to early 90s, and the anti-hero of the late 90s to early 2000s. Piper felt that he was the baddest guy in WWE history and wanted to know what the hype was all about with this Stone Cold guy. Austin came out donning the SVR 2006 attire, and Piper welcomed Austin 
to the pit before slapping him. Who else could do that to Stone Cold? Not The Rock, not Vince, not Mick Foley, but Piper himself. He thanked Hot Rod for having him before responding with a slap of his own, and because of this, he actually liked Stone Cold and respected him. The white chants were annoying him, so he asked if they were deaf, and they were bombarding him with these chants, and he even did it to Austin. He told Steve that he was the original rebel. You know, he was annoying Vince when WrestleMania didn't have an over, back when Austin was wearing diapers, and regarding the rebel thing, Steve's got nothing on him. He responded saying that he trusts no SOB, including Piper, and Austin wanted to know if he was supposed to be intimidated by this guy. Like, there's nothing scary about him. The kilt, the goatee, the broken down boots, damn. Piper saw this as them failing to communicate properly, and all of a sudden, Carlito Caribbean Cool interrupts. They were under the belief the other had Carlito planned to come out, and he told him straight up that they're not cool before saying nobody wants to see them. Piper's like, for you. He suggested they walk down to the back because it was his time and Carlito T spitting the apple, but Piper caught it and did the exact same thing to him. He blasts him, Austin watches on for a few before getting enrolled, he stomps a mud hole, poke in the eyes, and boom, stunner. They celebrate with some cold beverages, and after about a minute, Stone Cold stuns Hot Rod himself. I want to ask you guys a question, like for those of you that remember the mid-2000s, late-2000s, remember the WWE ice cream used to come with this little card, and I specifically recall the Stone Cold stunner on Hot Rod as being one of those cards. You guys remember it? Yeah, cool segment to cool down the crowd, and I was entertained. Oh no, it's time. I have a right mind to skip this, but we gotta talk about it. Well, if you wanna skip it, that's up to you. So Aki Bono, a sumo wrestler, faced Big Show in a sumo match. It's a first for WrestleMania, I believe. But anyways, they start things off after like seven minutes. And I don't know how to call them. So they're slapping each other, pushing each other away. Big Show's trying to force him out. And it was the unstoppable force meeting the immovable object. He screws up and Big Show once again falls on his ass to lose at WrestleMania for the hundredth time. Whatever that was, I don't know what it was. Who cares? I guess WWE wanted something for the Big Show. Add to that Aki Bono, I assume was big in Japan. I'm not sure. They thought it was a good idea. Yeah, I, I just, I'm just not interested in this. Every time I watch WrestleMania 21, I usually skip this because I, I don't really care about it. Also, if you didn't know, Aki Mono's an actual wrestler. He wrestled in All Japan Pro Wrestling. He actually won the world title there. He held the tag titles, I believe, and he actually managed to have a decent career down in All Japan. And it was time. The next match was for the WWE Championship. JBL defends the gold against John Cena. So. At this point, he had a rocket strapped to him the size of Batista's dick, bro. He had his own damn theme song, add to that his own custom belt, and if that wasn't enough, an album was planned for mid-2005. I can't name a single mid-carter, let alone a main eventer that had all of those things at the time. But with that said, Cena won the right to challenge for the title at No Way Out. JBL cost him the US gold, and then Teddy Long enforced a no-touch rule. John was trying his best to provoke JBL, but in the end, he went out on top after having Cena arrested for vandalizing his limousine. The WWE champion had a police escort, JBL money came Came falling out of the sky and I bet it's worth more than Usher books. He told Orlando Jordan to go to the back. Why? Because he wanted to do things on his own which is quite ironic due to the fact that JBL's entire title reign was saved by an external source. JBL had held the title for 280 days at this point. It was the longest title reign since Diesel in 1995. John Cena didn't have any flashy stuff. He was just donning that chain after nearly three years. He was finally gonna get that chance. The bell rings, collar and elbow tie up, the guy from the streets. This is the rich guy. JBL showed off his speed and aggressiveness in the very early going, and the heat this match had fizzled out quicker than Dean's heel run in 2018. It was honestly forgettable. JBL's in control trying to choke out Cena with the ropes. He hung him up, and the challenger tries fighting back, but took the one-handed spine buster. He gets the neck breaker, but Cena kicks out. Nasty boot, and things were looking very bad for the challenger. He tried battling back, but he's not down. JBL hits his brutal-ass clothesline and would have gotten him the victory, but Cena put his foot on the rope. Huge blow to the back, headlock, Cena drops him. Ugh, it's boring. Both men knock each other down with a clothesline of the crowd was just there. Hill takes back control on the outside and damn it just didn't kick into high gear. Back in the ring JBL hits the superplex and the commentary team sends the gloomy future for John Cena. JBL goes up top and lands into a power slam and once both men get up Cena finally fights back and the crowd starts waking up. He makes his comeback, shoulder tackles, side slam, five knuckle shuffle, he pumps up the rebox but JBL kicks him, goes for the clothesline from hell but Cena ducks and boom! F you. One, two, three. Three. JBL's time is up, and Cena's time is now. Well, that happened. I don't know why Cena's biting the title ain't made of chocolate, but match was honestly forgettable. While the match may have been boring, the moment Cena hoisted the title is still remembered to this very day, and I just don't know why it felt so anticlimactic. You know, I know both men aren't the best wrestlers, but it should have had some near falls excitement to it. Would it have been a world beater, but it would have been a bit better, so there's that. But yeah, John Cena, new champion, history was made, 
at WrestleMania 21. In an interview last year, JBL spoke about his matchup with John Cena. No doubt about it, going against Cena, I think it was WrestleMania 21 at the Staples Center, that was such a thrill, man. To go out in the main event at WrestleMania as a champion, I'm such a huge wrestling fan, I remember all the WrestleManias growing up as a kid. From WrestleMania 1, 2, 3, I remember the build-up to the big body slam of the Giant with Hulk Hogan. So getting to be in WrestleMania, then also getting to walk out as champion, I don't know if I'll ever have a moment that will be any more cool than that. Now that Cena was champion, fans were adoring him, they were loving him, he was riding high and he was basically enjoying life. I mean, the album was going to come out the next month and that reached number 15 on the Billboard 200 and number 3 on Hot Rap albums, which is completely ridiculous. And the victory in itself, like I said, it's an important chapter in his career, but you already know that. Next up, the Hall of Fame class of 2005 came out. It was a very star-studded one. Nikolai Folkov, former tag team champion. The Iron Sheik, former WWF champion in 1983. Mr. Wonderful, Paul Orndor, who main evented WrestleMania 1. Cowboy Bob Orn, who main evented WrestleMania 1 as well. Jimmy Hart, manager of the Hart Foundation. Nasty Boys, Hulk Hogan, a bunch of guys and factions. Rowdy Roddy Piper, IC champion and one of the greatest to never hold the WWF championship. And Hulk Hogan, six-time WWF champion, six-time WCW champion. You guys know him. Okay, it's time to get serious. Triple H defends the World Heavyweight Championship against Batista. Yeah, this one, it's the special one. So, Batista was not even supposed to be in this situation. It was for Randy Orton, but after his face run failed... Batista slotted in that role. Fans took a liking to him ever since November 2004, and just that moment where he teased going after the world title it was long-term storytelling. Because of this, they teased a little Batista Triple H confrontation. He got cheered, and funny enough, Vince felt this was a TV match. Triple H begged him to drag it to WrestleMania. Batista won the Rumble, and it was a great choice. He had this main event aura to him. Add to that, he treated himself like a star with the suits, the sunglasses, the little nuances. And even though 05 Batista wasn't the best in the ring, I don't care. He was awesome. Okay, Mortarhead performed Triple H's entrance theme song. Triple H takes a page out of the Brood's book, emerging from the pits of hell, I guess. And as for Batista, like John Cena, it was the same normal entrance. Okay, it was time for Evolution to implode. The bell rings and Batista didn't budge. It's like he's seen his future already in kayfabe. Rough collar and elbow tie up. Batista pushes the game away. Side headlock from the champ fails to take down Batista. And it took him a bit. As a matter of fact, he had to go full force. Triple H goes for it again, but runs into a press slam. Hard Irish whip from the animal and he corners Triple H with a strike and then a high back body drop. On the outside, Flair provided a distraction, gave it away to Triple H, finding an opening. And the ring began choking Dave. Flair did as well to the delight of fans. And following this, the game targets the lower back. All the while, the fans were loudly chanting, Batista, Batista. Blows to the back. Suplex gets him a near fall. Flair makes it two for two with the blazer choke and the pace was slowing down at this point. Triple H was trying to prevent Batista from bursting out and there were moments where that was going to happen, but luckily for himself, that wasn't the case. As he goes for the pedigree, Batista back drops him, and he responds with a face buster and the kick out Batista made got Triple H a bit worried. So he goes up top and walks into a clothesline. Then he proceeded to force the game right out of the ring, and he bounced back by bouncing Batista shoulder first into the steps. He then attempted a pedigree on the steps, but gets catapulted, and correct me if I'm wrong, this was when Batista took 90% control. Let's see if I'm wrong. The commentary team felt as if the momentum was shifting at this point. Batista was delivering some rough blows to the world champion. He was getting manhandled at this point. He was throwing him from corner to corner. And so much to the point where Triple H was begging for mercy. Running power slam gets him a two count. Triple H tries grabbing a chair, but the ref takes it away. And again, he's begging for mercy, but Flair comes in this time. The ref's distracted, and Triple H finally fights back using the title belt. But Batista kicks out, and the fans were loving it. He tries running towards the challenger, only to receive a spine buster. Batista bomb, how about low blow? Game tries going for the pedigree, but he couldn't lift the bastard. Add to the fact that he parted his hands away like the Red Sea, knocks him down, thumbs up, thumbs down, Batista bomb, one, two, three, he's finally done it. As JR said, the beast has been unleashed. Fans went unglued at the result, and it shows just how invested in the story they were. I mean, Batista was a main man following this victory, and after the match, he raised the title right at Triple H's face, adding insult to injury. Match itself, it was way better than John Cena versus JBL, and it did drag at some points, but for the most part, it was decent. It wasn't as good as neither Orton, nor Angle, or Sean, but it was decent enough. It wasn't special, it wasn't really good outright, but like I said, it did its job. It showed that Batista was an animal, a force to be reckoned with, so there's that. Like I said, it dragged at some points, but whatever, it did its job, so there's that. Overall, WrestleMania 21 was good as hell. Sure, the main events may have dragged it down, but who cares, right? I mean, despite that, those two moments, they're still talked about to this very day. They're finally filling the void that Austin and Rock left. I'm not saying John Cena and Batista are bigger than Austin and Rock. Somebody's gonna comment that. I'm not saying that, no. I'm just saying, like, they filled that void of the top two babyfaces being missing. Other than that, like, those, if it wasn't for that, this would be the greatest WrestleMania of all time. Like, if those two matches just delivered a little bit, it would
would be the GOAT WrestleMania. It was the greatest undercard in WrestleMania history in my eyes. You know, you had Eddie versus Ray, good match. You had the Money in the Bank, which was superb stuff, best Money in the Bank match of all time. In my eyes, you had Undertaker versus Randy Orton, which was good as hell, established Orton as a star despite the fact that he lost. It was a very important chapter in his career. You had Kurt Angle versus Shawn Michaels, which was legendary. Cena winning the title, and Batista hoisting the title in the end, so there's that. Like I said, this WrestleMania is probably top five for me. Yeah, I like the vibe, the theme, everything about it. I have it on DVD. It's one of the only DVDs I have. I used to have a bunch of them as a kid. And while it could have been better, you know, The Rock could have returned and had the little thing at WrestleMania with somebody like Randy Savage. I don't think it was going to be good, but just the sight of it, it would have been memorable for certain. Or if only had a match with Sting. Either way... It would have been a sight to see had The Rock faced one of those two. But yeah, it's still one of my favorite WrestleManias of all time, despite the fact the main events didn't deliver as well as they did. What would you guys think of WrestleMania 21? Please comment down below. And that's it for this video. Make sure you hit a FU on the like button and perhaps a Batista bomb on the subscribe button. Peace. I'm out.